Hello and welcome to GameSack. The Sega Astro City Mini was released in Japan recently to celebrate Sega's 60th anniversary, and it's the latest in the so-called mini console market. Now this one is full of arcade games with no console games at all. I imported it from Japan because, well, I love Sega games and also I wanted to make an episode about it and here we are. Let's start off by checking out the unit itself. The Sega Astro City Mini was released on December 17th, 2020, only in Japan. At the time of making this video, no other regions have had a release date announced. The style of the unit mimics Sega's real Astro City arcade machines that were popular in Japan. It features a 3 and 7 8 inch 16x9 LCD screen. It also has a micro switch joystick and buttons, all of which feel great. The coin and start buttons are not micro switched though. And that makes me want to throw this thing into the river! Sanwa buttons are nothing! I'm just kidding, nobody cares. The joystick and buttons feel really good to use during gameplay despite their tiny size. Up top you have stereo speakers, and yes they are actually in stereo for the few games here that support it, but the effect is barely noticeable. On the back, you have the power switch, full-size HDMI jack, USB inputs for player 1 and 2, a headphone jack, and a USB port for power. This device cannot run on batteries. The screen quality here isn't bad at all. Of course, you have black borders on the side, as none of the games here are 16x9. There are a couple of wallpaper options that you can use if having black bars bothers you for some odd reason. The Sega Astro City Mini is powered by whatever chipset is hidden beneath this. Sold separately are a matching control pad and a joystick. The controller is pretty cool. It's only minimally concerned about player comfort, similar to the Sega Master System controller. But the D-pad and buttons here are pretty nice, with lots of pivot in the D-pad itself. I definitely recommend it if you like using controllers. The joystick is large and quite hefty. The stick and the buttons are of incredible quality, at least to me. I'm sure there will be purists out there who gripe about it for some reason, but not me. I can't think of any reason to complain about it, and I love using it. I also love how the joystick has high resolution and stereo of the art sound to double my playing enjoyment. This verbiage is straight from the real Astro City arcade machine, just so you know. Even the controller has high resolution graphics and stereo of the art sound to double my playing enjoyment. I think that's pretty much a requirement these days. The great news about these controllers is that they can plug and play with devices like the Mister and your PC and the like. The bad news is that no other USB controller that I tried, and I tried a lot, will work with the Sega Astro City Mini. Powering the thing up brings you to the menu where you have access to the 37 games that are on here. That is a lot of games. On each game you can shuffle between a couple of different screenshots and the title to see what the game is all about. A few of the games even let you sample one of the musical selections. If you press the coin button here, you're greeted with the settings menu. Here you can select the language which will affect the menu, but not any text within the games themselves. The brightness and volume only take effect if you're playing the unit without it being hooked up with HDMI. The screen settings allow you to choose an analog display mode which basically adds crappy scan lines to the game. And these are some really bad scan lines, so leave this option disabled. Unless of course you like things that look absolutely horrible. And then of course the previously mentioned wallpaper options. And that's it as far as the settings go. When you start a game, you're told a little bit about it and also what the buttons do, which is nice. From here, you can also start a new game or continue from a saved state. During gameplay, if you press coin and start at the same time, you can save or load your state, reset the game, or return to the main menu. You only have two save slots per game. I use the second slot as a general save when I'm done playing, that way my scores are saved. I then use slot 1 as a regular save state as you'd normally use such a feature if you need it. With HDMI, you get 720p visuals just like all of the other mini consoles out there. Anyone remember 720p? How quaint. The games fill your screen vertically, so they're not integer scaled at all and there's no interpolation. That means there will always be some shimmering scrolling and uneven diagonal lines in every game, but its severity depends on which game you're playing. Playing with HDMI, I do feel a tiny bit of lag. I was able to adapt to it pretty well though, and it wasn't bad enough to be a deal breaker for me. Playing on the little screen there is the same lag, but I think it's harder to detect since everything is so tiny. Audio wise you'll get 2 channel stereo at 48kHz which is all you need. There is a little bit of audio delay and it's usually between 3 and 5 frames, so it's better than the Genesis Mini. The system retails for 12,780 yen which is about 120 US dollars. The controller is just under 2800 yen or about 26 US dollars and the joystick is about the same price as the Astro City Mini itself.
So now, of course, I've got to talk about the games, each and every one of them, just like usual. And I'll be talking about these games in the order that they're numbered on the unit itself. So let's check out what these games are and how they run. The first game on here is Flicky. Yeah, good old Flicky. It's in every Sega compilation, but at least this is the arcade version. You're a blue bird, and your goal is to collect a yellow chick scattered throughout the level and take them to the door. Cats appear, and if they touch your chicks, they stop following you. If the cats touch you, then you die. Once you get into a groove, it can be kind of fun, but initially it feels very slippery. The next game is Sega Ninja, otherwise known as Ninja Princess. This is a vertically scrolling run and gun where you can shoot in eight directions. You also have a button to shoot straight ahead no matter which way you run. This is more helpful than you may think. The last button is your ninja magic, which causes you to disappear briefly to avoid enemies or their projectiles. This is a fun game, but it's extremely challenging. Next, we have My Hero, and I've only ever played this on the Master System. The arcade version here is more or less the same as far as the graphics and sound go. You're strolling down the street with your girlfriend, and then she gets kidnapped for no reason, so you just start attacking everyone. You don't have much reach with either your punch or your jump kick, so attacking enemies is difficult. On top of that, your hitbox is gigantic, so it's easy to get hit. And when you do, you die immediately. To top it all off, the tune that plays when you die will soon make you enraged like you've never been before. Ugh, it's like it's making fun of me! Ah! There's a part where you rescue a tied up pink dude and he fights with you. He doesn't really seem to help much at all, he just causes visual confusion as you try to control your character. I don't recall this being in the Master System version. This is a fun one to let your friends play just to see how pissed off they get. Ah! Of course, Space Harrier is on here, why wouldn't it be? You fly around and shoot things. Notice in the lower right it says Control Reverse. If you want to change that, just hold down the C and F buttons for about a second. I recommend reverse controls if you're playing with a joystick and normal controls if you're playing with a controller. The sound emulation isn't the best here, but it's mostly good enough. A lot of times, the scream doesn't happen when you get hit. This also seems to be newly emulated and not based on M2's previous emulations of the game, judging by how the rocks behave in Stage 7 here. To my knowledge, it hasn't been announced who did the emulation for the Sega Astro City Mini, but I'm confident in saying that it was not M2. Still, the emulation here is fine except for the minor sound issues. Of course, Fantasy Zone needs to be on this collection as well. Am I ever going to be able to stop talking about this game? Apparently not, and this won't be the last time either, since it's on the Switch on the Sega Ages label, so I'll have to cover it in that upcoming episode. Anyway, what can I say? It's Fantasy Zone. The cool thing here, though, is that they give you the option for normal and rapid fire. This makes the game much more fun to play. The original Wonder Boy is game number six on here. If you've played the first Adventure Island on the NES, then you'll be very familiar with this one as it's the same thing, only in the arcade. This version is more difficult than Adventure Island and the Master System port of this, though. There seems to be a lot more momentum here, and it can be tough to avoid enemies or other bad things when you're trying to stop from running. Overall, it's a great game. After that is Quartet 2, called so because this is the two-player version. You can choose from any of the four characters, though. I love this version of the game. Basically, you just need to find the boss of each level who has the key, kill it, and then take the key to the exit. Along the way, you can grab power-ups and extended abilities. This plays great on the Astro City Mini, especially with the external joystick. You have a rapid fire mode on this one as well. In fact, a lot of games on the Astro City Mini have this option. I had a hard time putting this one down. The music is great, so that certainly helps, but it's still fun otherwise. Next is Alex Kidd with Stella, The Lost Stars. Yep, Sega tried to bring Alex Kidd to the arcade. It didn't work out so well, and this game is a huge quarter muncher. All you need to do is make it to the end of the stage, but it's super tough to avoid getting touched. When that happens, you die instantly with your irritating little scream. At the end of each stage is a boss of sorts, but you don't need to kill them, you just need to get past them to expose the Miracle Ball. The really good news is that you need to go through this game twice to beat it. You can power through it by adding a billion credits if you must. At least the music by Hero is really good, but not as good as his OutRun or Space Harrier scores. Here we have Alien Syndrome. 
This overhead running gun has you running around rescuing hostages. As you do that, you kill aliens and grab better weapons. After you free every hostage, you fight the stage boss. This version is insanely tough, mainly because there are zero continues. You need to beat the entire game on one credit. Can you? Next is Wonder Boy in Monsterland. This is such a weird game to be in arcade as it has lots of RPG and adventure overtones. It's all in Japanese, but fortunately most of the tricks I learned from the Superior Master System version work here. It feels really odd to play this with a joystick. It feels a bit better with the controller, so play it that way if you can. Coming in at number 11 is Shinobi. This is a fantastic game that everyone should play. The dip settings on this one seem to be a bit high as there are a few more ninjas than normal, but it's still quite doable. Some of the sound effects lack consistency, as they'll sound normal one minute and more quiet the next, but really it's only noticeable if you've played the actual arcade a million times like me. Also, a few instruments in a couple of the musical selections are panned left for some reason. This is wrong, especially since the actual arcade hardware this game runs on is in mono. The pictures of Marilyn Monroe have been completely removed from the beginning of stage two. They also changed the color of these wall ninjas to yellow. They used to be blue before, but they still didn't look like Spider-Man or anything, so I'm curious why they did that. This is still a great game though, just remember that you cannot continue at all in the final stage. Sonic Boom is the only Sonic game on here, and it's not even a Sonic game. Instead, it's an overhead shooter in TAKE MODE! You fly airplanes and it has all of that standard stuff as you'd expect in such a game, though it's really nothing special at all. There's a lot of shimmering in the graphics as they scroll. Next up is Altered Beast. A lot of people dislike this game, but I've always enjoyed it for what it is. Beat everyone up and grab the orbs from the white two-headed wolves. It's certainly not an outstanding game by any means, but it reminds me of being in the arcades not long before the Genesis was released. After that, we have Scramble Spirits, another Tate vertical shooter. This one is very detailed and it's hard to see because the video is only 720p. It's definitely a better game than Sonic Boom, much more interesting, but it still doesn't quite reach greatness. The music is really nice, but you won't be able to hear much of it underneath the white noise that is your weapons firing. The last Wonder Boy game on here is Wonder Boy 3 Monster Lair. This one auto-scrolls and once again you need to collect fruit to stay alive. You collect six different weapons, none of which last very long. The second half of each stage plays like a shooter. This game is alright, but if you can, play the TurboGrafx CD version instead. So far we've seen a lot of games that I've already talked about on the Sega Ages releases for the PlayStation 2 and the Saturn. Sorry about that, but I've got to mention them if they're covered here. Anyway, let's check out the rest of these games. Game Ground is game number 16. This one is in Tate mode and is very detailed. Again, since the resolution is only 720p, we can't get an even scale, so some of that detail looks jumbled. I've never really gotten hugely into this game as it's slow and honestly not very exciting for me. But it's here if you enjoy it, though slightly compromised visually. Next is Crackdown, another high resolution game. This one looks mostly fine here though. It's designed to be played by two players, hence the screen that's split three ways. The third split is for the big map on top. Your goal is to place bombs at the places that the enemy has marked for you as this will ensure the destruction of their hideout. Despite how simple it is, I enjoyed this one quite a bit, and I'm glad to have finally gotten around to playing the arcade version here. Then there's Golden Axe. This beat-em-up is of course an absolute classic. The Genesis version is great, but this is better in every single way except overall length. Yeah, it's short, but I'm always down to play through this game. They even managed to keep all of the screams from First Blood in here. 
The difficulty is set perhaps a bit too easy, but I guess that doesn't matter much when you have unlimited continues. Maybe try restricting your credits with this one. Here's Cyber Police E SWAT. I always enjoyed this one in the arcades. I was surprised that the Genesis version was pretty much a completely different game. You start out as a lowly human being shooting the bad guys. It kind of plays like Revenge of Shinobi with limited ammo and you need to collect more as you go, except in this game you can shoot up. Eventually, you get promoted to Robocop. Here, you have better weapons and your armor breaks away as you take damage. This one's kind of goofy in a lot of ways, but it still reminds me of fun times in the arcade. Shadow Dancer is another one that's almost completely different from its home version. This game is more sloppy in the arcade with cluttered artwork that looks rather messy. The goofy animations don't help much either. It's super tough as I don't feel the level design is something that got much attention. Even the sound and music are lacking. With all that said, it's still fun to play this one just to see how different it is. You can't just plow through this one by adding credits as you start at the beginning of a round if you die. Like I said, not as good as the Genesis version, but I'm still glad it's here. Alien Storm comes in at game 21. I've only ever played the Genesis version of this one until right now. I guess you could say it's a beat-em-up. A really weird beat-em-up with a few different modes like first-person shooting segments. Overall, it's a bit better than the Genesis version in most ways, and it's definitely worth playing through. I really like the colors in this one, and there are a ton of voices, some of which I can even understand. You're dope, dude. Then there's Columns. I guess this needs to be in every Sega collection too. Nothing special here. Bonanza Brothers is here as well. This one looks pretty clean aside from the shimmering that you'll notice occasionally. I don't like being forced to play in split screen mode. However, it seems the more and more I play this game, the more I enjoy it. I mean, not that I love it or anything. <laughs> Columns 2 is here as well. Oh goody. I like this one less than the original as the game style is Flash Columns. Thunder Force AC is an odd one to find on here. This is basically a slightly upgraded version of Thunder Force 3 on the Genesis. Well, mostly upgraded. The music is now in mono because I guess that's what arcade goers prefer, I don't know. This is also the game that the Super Nintendo title Thunder Spirits is based on. It plays well here and it sounds great too. I'm just glad a horizontal shooter is in this collection. I much prefer horizontal shooters to vertical ones as they somehow seem less generic. Game number 26 is Radmobile, which is purported to be Sega's first 32-bit game ever. You race across the country with a very strict time limit. Sometimes you'll need to turn on your headlights in dark areas, or turn on your wipers when it's raining. There's so much immersion that you might think you're really driving. I had a hard time controlling this with the joystick, and I think the next time I try this, I'll use the controller instead, as that may help a tiny bit. Also, this game was Sonic the Hedgehog's very first appearance in any video game ever. Just in case you weren't aware of that little bit of trivia. Also on here is the arcade version of the first Cotton game. Awesome, another horizontal shooter. Here, you play as a witch with a Halloween style setting, which is pretty awesome. This is a weird game for sure, and I'm not the hugest Cotton fan, but I can appreciate it for what it is, I guess. You gotta collect all these gems that bounce around the screen and they add to your special weapons. I think that's how this game works anyway. The graphics and the music are great and they're the main reasons to play this one. The game only lets you continue from where you died once. After that, it's back to the beginning of the stage for you. Arabian Fight is even on here. This is a super awkward beat-em-up with characters that are way too big for their own good. The gameplay is haphazard at best. Stuff is just all over the place and it's often difficult to tell even what's going on. You'll even find yourself off screen from time to time. At least the emulation here is better than MAME though. If you recall, I talked about this game in a Left in the Arcades episode and the sky here was black. 
I said that it probably should be blue. And look, it is. This is definitely worth trying out once at the minimum, and at least you'll be getting a properly emulated experience here. Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder is the outstanding sequel to the original game. This title is finally making its way home in a few different ways, and it's good to see it on here. I have the actual arcade board, so yeah, I noticed some inaccuracies like the broken music here, followed by some way too quiet sounds. But hey, at least it has sound. If you've been watching the show for a while, you know my arcade board no longer makes any sound at all. I love frying the enemies to death with my magic. I'm not a big fan of the other three characters in the game, so I only use the generic guy, but that's just me. There are a few branching paths here and there, but keep in mind that this is the Japanese version. That means the paths you skip over never need to be played through. On the US version, you need to play through every stage to beat the game. This is one of a few big reasons to pick up a Sega Astro City mini thingy. Of course, Puyo Puyo is on here. I certainly like this one better than Columns. Match four of the same color jelly blobs in any configuration to make them disappear. And yeah, that's right, this is the arcade version of Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Number 31 is Dark Edge, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game I've never played until now. This is an awful 3D fighting game that predates Virtua Fighter by many, many months. So I guess that technically this is the first 3D fighting game ever, despite being comprised of 2D sprites. The control is just awful. You have strong and weak punches and kicks as well as a jump button. The camera angle makes it difficult to fight much of the time, and honestly it confuses me. You can do some special moves, but do the directions that you need to input change if the enemy is in front of you instead of to your right, for example? I really can't tell. The graphics are pretty bad and very pixelated, and the music is just okay. This isn't much fun to play at all, but it is interesting that it exists. For that reason, I'm glad it's on here to satiate my curiosity, even though I didn't know it existed before seeing it here. Tant R is basically a bunch of mini games for you to play. Mostly of the brain teaser variety, but it can still be fun. Virtua Fighter is another big reason to desire a Sega Astro City Mini. This is a fun game and it looks great here, nice and crisp for the most part. What's really interesting is that the polygons seem to be rendered out in full 720p, which is quite a bit higher resolution than the arcade's 480p. The game has never looked this sharp, at least officially, and it plays mostly fine as well, but there are some emulation issues. Mostly, it runs at the same frame rate as the original arcade as you play, which is about 29 or so frames per second. However, when a match is finished, it can drop a ton of frames on the replay animations. It doesn't look great at all, and I guess the hardware of the Astro City Mini isn't quite up to the task. Fortunately, this issue doesn't seem to affect the actual gameplay. Interestingly, this problem doesn't seem to happen at all when you play it on the Astro City Mini's own screen. Obviously, it's rendering at a lower resolution when you're playing it this way, so you're really only going to run into this issue if you're using the HDMI output. Another issue is that sometimes the sound is slightly distorted from it being too loud on the preamp level. Oh yeah! Turning it down on your end won't change this. They'd have to lower the volume in the software. It could also be that the Astro City Mini hardware is just strained trying to run this all as well. I'm not entirely sure. Still, it's pretty awesome that this game is on here. Next is Stack Columns. Yay, another Columns game. Does the world really enjoy Columns as much as Sega thinks we do? I don't like it. Then there is Ichidant R. This is the sequel to Tant Art with more brain teaser type mini games. After this is Puyo Puyo 2. This one adds the ability to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise with different buttons. I don't hate this one, and I did okay with it. I just don't like the blank blobs that are constantly falling in my play area. The 
last game on here is called Dottori Kun. This is clearly not an arcade game. It plays like Sega's old arcade game called Head On, except that you can change directions. There's no sound at all here. The description for this one only says, the one that is already in there. Okay. Oh well, I'd still rather play this than Columns. There you go, that's the Sega Astro City Mini. Overall, I really like it. Now, it's not perfect, but come on, I wasn't really expecting it to be, was anyone? But I've got to say that it is my favorite mini system so far. Now, I doubt this will ever get a release outside of Japan, but hey, never say never. And if they do, I wonder if they'll change up the lineup of games at all. Who's to say? Anyway, what do you guys think of the Astro City Mini? Let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Are you tired of using controllers with low resolution graphics, mono of the art sound, and regular playing enjoyment? I hate controllers that have low resolution graphics, but mono of the art sound too? And just regular playing enjoyment? <sighs> we'll step up to the Sega Astro City Pad! High resolution graphics and stereo of the art sound double your playing enjoyment! High resolution graphics! Stereo of the art sound! Not only am I having fun, but I'm having exactly twice the amount of fun. Not 199%, not 201%, but 200% the amount of fun as I was before. It can be measured. Sega Astro City! Hello and welcome to GameSec. It's time to take a look at the PlayStation 3. That's right, the PS3 is retro now. At least retro enough. I mean, it's 15 years old. Anyway, the console has a lot to offer and the prices aren't absurd yet. But first, let's take a quick look at the console itself. Sony PlayStation 3! The PlayStation 3 was released in November of 2006 at $500 for the 20GB model and $600 for the 60GB version. It was the most expensive console launch since the 3DO. The PS3 was also backwards compatible with the PlayStation 1 and 2. The prices eventually came down as Sony trimmed down the hardware, removing things like PlayStation 2 backwards compatibility and relegating the PlayStation 1 compatibility to software emulation. The console received stiff competition from the Xbox 360 and lagged behind it in sales for most of its life. Sony eventually released a slim version of the console and, later on, a slightly slimmer version still, both at reduced prices. The controller initially did not feature rumble support as Sony said that it would interfere with the six-axis motion control, but it was added in later after owners of the system complained. The motion control somehow still worked. The PS3 was the first console to use a Blu-ray drive for up to 50 gigabytes of disk storage and most games were able to play directly from the disc without being installed. The console also offered the ability to play Blu-ray movies and was one of the best Blu-ray players for quite some time. The PlayStation 3 is powered by the Cell processor, which is a 3.2 GHz PowerPC CPU. It has 256 megabytes of work RAM. The graphics were handled by the NVIDIA RSX Reality Synthesizer, which, in fact, synthesized reality. The GPU ran at 500 megahertz and had its own 256 megabytes of graphics RAM. Slightly superior to the Xbox 360 on paper, multi-platform games often ran a bit better on the 360. As for audio, the PlayStation 3 offers 7.1 channels of uncompressed sound. It was also the first console to support HDMI. Eventually, the PS3 offered online gameplay which was free and did not require a subscription of any kind. Besides being hacked, resulting in some downtime that lasted many weeks, I found that the online service worked fairly well. The PlayStation 3 was still being sold in some territories as late as 2017, slightly outselling the Xbox 360 with over 87 million units sold with over 2,000 games released.
I'd also like to mention that the PS3 was the first console with 1080p. This couldn't happen on the Xbox 360 until it got HDMI, and that didn't happen until well after the PS3 was released. Anyway, this episode is about the games, and I'd like to mainly focus on ones that were exclusive for the console. Mostly. That one that you really want me to cover? Not gonna talk about it, just out of spite. Anyway, let's look at some games on this thing. MotorStorm was an early racing game for the system. Now you may or may not remember the incredible footage that Sony was showing off of this game when they announced the PlayStation 3. I mean, wow, we'd be playing stuff that looked like this in our own homes next year! What we ended up getting was this. Yeah, it was actually kind of sad. As a result, this game has always been synonymous with disappointment when I think about it. In hindsight, this game honestly doesn't look horrible for an early PS3 game, it's just that Sony set the bar way too high for what they wanted people to expect from the console. As a game it plays okay, though the bouncy, floaty nature of the visuals and the controls give me motion sickness after a half hour or so, whereas most other racing games don't. This one also features very lengthy load times. I did have a bit of fun with this one, but I never enjoyed it enough to get the sequels that came out. This is Heavenly Sword by Ninja Theory. This one requires a short install which happens each time you boot it up. It plays a lot like God of War with its hack and slash action. Well, a bit like it anyway. It also has some quick time events as you move about the cinematic set pieces. It's pretty rough around the edges, especially when it comes to the frame rate, but back then we didn't know a whole lot better. People back then just weren't super smart like everybody here in the present is. Still, this game can be quite enjoyable if you look past the roughness. It also has one of the few motion control sequences that I've actually enjoyed in a game. You launch these boulders and guide them at your target by aiming the controller itself. It's a gimmick, yes, but I think it's kind of a fun one. Make sure to check this one out. Of course, if you want real God of War action, there's always God of War 3. If you've played any God of War game before, you know exactly what to expect here. I'm not hugely into the franchise, but I did find this entry quite enjoyable. In fact, it's the only God of War game that I've ever bothered playing all the way through. It has some great action, awesome set pieces, and of course the glue that holds everything together is the quick time events, which everyone loves without exception. The music is very thematic as always, and the visuals even manage a fairly good frame rate considering all the detail. I feel this one is a must own. If you're a younger person, make sure to ask your dad before you play this one. Don't worry, he's a dad, so he's gonna let you. Another thing that I'd like to note is that the PlayStation 3 was notoriously difficult to develop for. So was the PlayStation 2. And that always seemed weird to me as the PS1 was really easy to develop for. Ken Kutaragi oversaw development of all three consoles, so I wonder why he had a change of heart for the PlayStation 2 and 3. Oh well, it is what it is, so let's take a look at more games. I sing the praises of 3D Dot Game Heroes every chance I get. This amazing adventure game from Atlas and From Software came out in 2010, and it plays a lot like a standard overhead Zelda game from the 8 and 16-bit days. Basically, your 2D world has been changed into 3D, and now it's fraught with evil. You have to go around and set things right. Like I said, it plays almost exactly like the best Zelda games do, going screen to screen, finding new weapons and abilities, and doing all sorts of fun stuff to progress further. The visuals are phenomenal. These days you may think that it looks like Minecraft, but no. 3 d Game Heroes did this look first, and honestly I think it does it better. I love the depth of field effects in this one, and the color is really nice in a generation that was largely washed out with browns and grays. And let's not forget the really fun soundtrack which is very chiptune-esque. 
When it comes down to it, the game is super fun and very hard to put down. The difficulty is just right, and it offers up a decent challenge but won't make you toss any controllers. This one gets overlooked a lot because of its stupid name, but make no mistake, there is a phenomenal game here. Little Big Planet got its start on the PlayStation 3 in 2008. At its heart, this is a 2D platformer, kind of a strange one actually. However, you could also create your own levels and share them with the world which was pretty fun, though it took a bit to figure out how to use the tools that the game provides. I had a lot of fun with this aspect at the time. In fact, this stage here you're looking at now is a stage that I created back then. And yes, most people took the Mario Maker approach and made their stages very difficult. And I was certainly no exception to that trope. It's just what noob designers do, I was no different. It was really fun to share my stages though and play through other people's creations. As far as playing the game proper goes, you control Sackboy and you run through many stages full of licensed music that have a diorama-like look to them. The visuals are very unique, especially for the time. It almost looks kind of real and even cinematic in its presentation. It was all very well put together and I had an immensely good time with this title. Little Big Planet 2 came out a few years later in 2011. I thought I wanted more of this, so of course I picked it up. And yes, the main game is still pretty fun. However, I just couldn't get back into creating stages of my own anymore. I had already had my fun with that aspect, and I didn't feel I needed any more of that. I was able to make it through the main game in only a couple of days, and while I definitely enjoyed it, I never came back to it. They also released Little Big Planet 3 in 2014, but I never got around to picking it up. Still, this is a fun series. There's also Little Big Planet Karting, because of course there is. This one requires a rather lengthy install. The game is what you'd expect, a kart version of Little Big Planet with various weapons to help you cheat your way to victory. Basically, it's just like every other kart game. As far as the gameplay goes, it's not bad. Drifts are easy to do and the controls feel good. I also like the graphics and the music. What I don't really care for is that it's all put together like a regular little Big Planet game and I never found this map type thing intuitive. That's because you can't really tell what a lot of these races are. A lot of them you'll just be alone or training and that's no fun. It's not a bad title, but honestly you're better off spending your time playing any Mario Kart game. Metal Gear Solid 4 from Konami was another exclusive game for the PS3. This 2008 game was very ambitious. Hideo Kojima didn't hold anything back, Konami let him do almost anything he wanted. Nobody told him anything was a bad idea. As a result, the game is mostly cutscenes from beginning to end. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of gameplay here, but there are so many cutscenes and they can be long. I've never really been able to get hugely into this one, but that doesn't mean it's a horrible game or anything. I like how Hideo Kojima insisted that all of the audio be uncompressed. In fact, this is the reason that it was never released on the Xbox 360 as it was just too big and Kojima didn't want to split it up over multiple discs. Not that most people are going to notice the difference between compressed and uncompressed audio, but I think it's cool. I guess he felt if you have all that space on a Blu-ray, you might as well use it. Even though I'm not super into this game, I'm still glad that it exists. It's a good game to bring up when you want to ruin the lives of Xbox 360 fanboys. I had both consoles, so I didn't care. Time Crisis is always fun. 
That's why Time Crisis Raising Storm from Namco is a great disc. This 2010 disc bundles three games. Raising Storm is your typical gun game. You can use the regular PS3 controller or the Move Motion controller to play. You don't duck and cover all the time like a typical Time Crisis game. While the graphics look a bit gray and dusty like so many games of the time, they're still really good. Lots of fun enemies to fight and I love all of the crazy shouting that goes on. So much fun with this one. They're coming from below! Time Crisis 4 was originally released on the PS3 in 2007, but on this disc it features support for the PlayStation Move. It's a lot better as a result, honestly. It's really fun and you get the classic Time Crisis duck and cover action. I played this originally with Namco's Gun Con 3 back in 2007, but I gotta say that playing it with the Move makes the game so much more enjoyable. Just hold down the trigger and keep firing! Gotcha. The final game on the disc is Dead Storm Pirates. This is another Namco arcade gun game that works with the move. It's pretty silly, but also tons of fun. It's also a nice break from the more modern settings of the Time Crisis games. If you like gun games, then there's no way you could ever go wrong with this title. And yes, each game on this disc supports two players simultaneously. Here's Genji, Days of the Blade. You know, why can't they just call this Genji 2? I swear, publishers fear putting numbers on their sequels anymore. That goes for movies as well. Anyway, this is a launch game for the system, and since there's no number, you wouldn't know that it's a sequel to the PlayStation 2 game unless you were familiar with the original. This one has some promise, but I don't feel that it lives up to the PS2 game. In fact, it's not even close to being as entertaining. The forced camera angles are really bad here, much worse than they were in the original game. You'll spend a lot of time running at the screen. The combat is good though. Once you're fully charged up, you can unleash a super quick time event throwdown, which is always fun. You can switch between up to four characters on the fly, which is cool. And they even have their own life bars. You can also switch weapons with the press of a button. This is the game that became a meme when Sony had their press conference at E3 in 2006. Check it out. Uh, Genji 2 is an action game, which is based on Japanese history. Uh, being based on history, the um, stages of the game will also be based on famous battles which took, actually took place in ancient Japan. So here's this giant enemy crab. I'll switch over to Yoshitsune, hop on its stomach, and you attack its weak point for massive damage. You of course remember the giant enemy crabs from your Japanese history courses, right? Unfortunately, I couldn't get to any giant enemy crabs here because I was playing this palace stage and it just goes on and on. It's very tiring. The game needs better pacing. The music is very appropriate and I love it, but the stages are so long that you'll probably never want to hear any of it again after you're done. Overall, I do like this game, but it just kind of feels like a chore. One thing I really liked about the PlayStation 3 is you could plug in almost any USB controller and it worked just fine in games like Street Fighter 4. You didn't have to buy a special controller that was specifically compatible with the console like you did on the 360. Of course, they had to change that when the PS4 came out. Anyway, more games. It's hard to talk about the PlayStation 3 and not mention the Uncharted series from Naughty Dog. The first game came out in late 2007, and I thought it was cool, but I just didn't get much into it at first. I felt it was a bit difficult as I had gotten stuck at a certain spot a couple of hours into the game. A few years later, I came back to it and I breezed through that part I was stuck at, and overall it's quite a fantastic title. You control Nathan Drake as he raids tombs for treasure and kills a whole lot of people in the process. I mean a lot of people. As in, several hundred people will be dead by your hands at the end of the game who were alive in the beginning. And you know what? I'm totally fine with that. I mean, it's their fault for getting in the way of my treasure and my bullets. There's some puzzle elements with this one, but it never feels like a chore and it's always interesting. The game does get a bit weird towards the last third or so, but I'll forgive it.
Uncharted 2 came out in 2009 and I was all over it. This improves everything from the first game, especially the story. Yeah, I know I say I don't care about stories in games often, but this one is pretty cool. The locales and the gameplay and everything are awesome. In fact, I like this game so much that the first time I beat it, I played through it again on a harder difficulty. Then, after I beat that, I played through it a third time on the hardest difficulty. That says a lot about a game if you play through it again right away when you beat it. Have you ever done that? This was also one of the first games I ever got a platinum trophy on. It's definitely one of the all-time great games for the console. Uncharted 3 came out in 2011. Once again, this is another great game with a fun adventure. Gotta be honest though, I didn't like it as much as Part 2. In fact, I don't think the series will ever be able to live up to Part 2 again. Still, this is a worthy adventure that's worth your time if you enjoyed any of the previous entries. There's also a 3D mode on this one if you have a 3D TV. Remember the 3D craze that was started with the first Avatar movie? Unfortunately, the 3D effects were kind of weird and not very well done, so I urge you to play it in 2D. You really can't go wrong with any of the games in this series. What do you think you're doing? Get it. The House of the Dead 4 was originally an arcade game, but it was ported exclusively to the PlayStation 3. You can use your controller or your PlayStation Move to shoot down all of the zombies and other various creepy monsters. It's all very arcade-like, just as you'd expect. This is not normal. Well, it is for this series, lady. The graphics don't exactly push the limits of the PlayStation 3 or anything, but it's fun to be able to play this one at home. Sometimes you can choose your route, which adds a bit to the replayability if you can remember which way you chose last time. I prefer using the Move controller because it feels more like an actual light gun game. However, your wrist is going to pay the price because you're forced to waggle the gun every few seconds to reload. Sometimes monsters grab you and you have to waggle them off of you. It's like Sega was able to put motion control into their arcade guns and they just wanted to use it. A lot. Other than that, this is a fun little game. No time to rest. Behind us! In front! You shouldn't underestimate me. How about the House of the Dead Overkill Extended Cut? Now this is what I'm talking about. Basically, this game is like Quentin Tarantino meets the House of the Dead. Every level is presented as its own grindhouse film. This was originally released on the Wii, and it was great there. But here on the PS3, it's now in HD and also features move support. You don't have to waggle to reload your gun, but you can if you want. You can also press the move button or just let the game reload for you automatically. During the levels, you can shoot cash to get money, which you can use later to upgrade the capabilities of your gun or buy new ones, which is quite helpful. There are also other collectibles to shoot and also a red thing which slows down time for a bit so you can get better shots. The PS3 version here adds a couple of brand new levels to play through as well as some other additional content. There's a 3D mode, but I haven't tried it in 3D as I no longer have a 3D TV. But it does come with two sets of anaglyph red and blue 3D glasses. I bet some of the 3D effects are fun, like this one. It's gotta look pretty cool. Maybe I'll have to give those paper glasses a try. The characters in this game are hilarious, and if you're allergic to swearing, then you don't want anything to do with this one. This really is what the series needed. It keeps in line with the regular House of the Dead characters and gameplay and expands upon it, making things fresh and more interesting. In fact, this might be my favorite House of the Dead game, and I don't think you should overlook it. This game is also available on mobile phones, and you can get a typing of the Dead version for the PC, which is awesome. But the PlayStation 3 version here is no slouch. That's my stage, bitch! In 2013, Naughty Dog gave PlayStation 3 owners a game called The Last of Us. In this one, you fight zombie-like things on what ends up being a large escort mission. These zombie-like things have good hearing, so you have to sneak around them and stuff. 
When I got this, I got stuck in a certain place a few hours into the game and I gave up. Then a few years later I tried it again and I breezed right past the part I was stuck on, just like I did with the original Uncharted. Still, I've got to admit that I never finished the game as it just wasn't as endearing as Uncharted was to me. I feel like the game takes itself too seriously. The gameplay is okay, but it's not really for me. The graphics are extremely well done for the console though, some of the best you'll see here. In fact, I'm amazed that this is a PS3 game. This game has its fans of course, but I'm not really one of them. I honestly can't imagine that I'll ever boot this one up again. Please don't tell me to try to get back into it, I've played it, I've, it's just not for me. Puppeteer is another amazing console exclusive. You're a puppeteer controlling puppets in a puppet show. Kind of weird, right? You've got some scissors as your weapon and you can even use it to move around some parts of a stage. You can get different heads which have different abilities which kind of reminds me of Kid Chameleon on the mighty 16-bit Sega Genesis. Anyone remember the Genesis? Anyway, you can hold three different heads at a time and switch between them on the fly. There's also a second character on screen that you can control to help you find hidden things and whatnot. This is a very creative game, and you can tell the designers had a lot of imagination. The visuals kind of remind me of Little Big Planet sometimes, but only kind of. They're extremely good, and everything looks very wood like. I love how the majority of the game is presented as a puppet show with a stage and a curtain. This one also has a 3D mode, but the depth is pretty shallow. The sound is great, with lots of audience reactions to certain things that happen on screen. This is such a fantastic title and is constantly overlooked just like it was when it was released. Don't pass this one up or you will miss out on a fantastic game with your PlayStation 3. He's on the passenger car. And what better way to soak in the moonscape than from the lavish seat of a classic locomotive. <laughs> so, stoke the cows today on the Horsey I was obsessed with Gran Turismo 5 when it came out in 2010. Although I somewhat enjoyed the previous games in the series, this is the one that won me over. Coming back to it for this episode is kind of tough though, as the cars handle and brake very slowly. It feels like I have very little control. If that sounds fun to you, then you want to check this one out right away. But somehow I was able to enjoy it quite a bit back then. The graphics were phenomenal for their time. I used to think it looked so real. It's also one of the few PS3 games that runs at 1080p and at 60 frames per second, most of the time. There can be some screen tearing if there's a lot on screen. I also like that this game allows custom soundtracks. Overall, this is a good game, but it's an acquired taste. I haven't played any other Gran Turismo games after this one. Maybe there will be a good one on the PlayStation 5. we're down to the final stretch of games. At least the final stretch of games that I'm showing in this particular episode. Let's finish this up. Hot Shots Golf Out of Bounds is a great addition to the series, also known as Everybody's Golf. It's super easy for anyone to pick up and play, and fun too. Even if you don't like golf, this one can be a great time, especially with friends. I remember playing this one online a lot, and I had a blast. And that says a lot, especially since I don't usually like playing games online. Of course you can't play this one online anymore, so you're just going to have to enjoy local multiplayer, which is even better. Nothing has really evolved here over the previous titles except for the ability to play online, but the graphics are certainly nicer. I've always felt that this one pushes the wind too much and too often. The wind just needs to calm the hell down. Other than that, this one is fantastic. <laughs> Flower is a very unique title from That Game Company. You play as a gust of wind straight out of Hot Shots Golf Out of Bounds, except that you're not quite that powerful. As weird as that sounds, it totally works for this game. 
You start out blowing a petal off of a single flower, guiding it to touch other flower buds. The more you touch, the more petals will be blowing with you. Guide your gust of wind around and touch all of the flowers you can, which will prompt new ones to pop up. Touch those and move on. It's pretty easy to figure things out after a few minutes. This one exclusively uses motion controls and is probably my favorite game without regular controls. Just hold a button to blow the wind and tilt the controller where you want to go. It works extremely well and it becomes second nature very quickly. The six axis controller is super precise and responsive here. This game could never be done with only a wimpy five axes. The graphics are simple yet incredible with tons of color. The sound and music are perfect as well. It's all very relaxing and believe it or not, there is an actual game in here. This used to be a digital only title, but you can get it physically on the Journey Collector's Edition disc. Speaking of Journey, this is another incredible game from that game company. You play as this individual. You see a giant mountain with a beacon of light way off in the distance and you make your way towards it. Soon you'll get a scarf that enables you to jump and it can be extended. The longer your scarf, the longer you can stay in the air. But it needs to be recharged every time and this can be done by touching the other brown scarves or ribbons that you find around. As you make your way, you free other ribbons and whatnot. There's not a lick of dialogue anywhere in this game. Often, someone else will show up who is actually another person playing the game and you both go through it together. Sadly, this feature doesn't work on the PlayStation 3 anymore since the online services have ceased. Still, this is an amazing game that's quite hard to describe. This one also got a port to the PlayStation 4 which also works great on the PlayStation 5. Roger Ebert was dead wrong when he said that video games can't be art. Demon's Souls came out from Atlas and From Software in 2009. This is where the Souls series started and I was absolutely obsessed with this game for quite a while after I got it. You play as a demon slayer and your job is to slay various demons, who would have thunk it? As you do, you'll collect their souls which can be used as currency in the Nexus to upgrade your abilities. If you die, and believe me you absolutely will, a lot, all of the souls that you are carrying go away. However, if you can make it back to the place where you died after you respawn and touch your bloodstain, you can get those souls back. If you die before then, they're all gone for good. This game is quite difficult until you get a good feel for it. As you upgrade yourself, it becomes immensely addictive. Playing it again here after all of these years, I had a bit of trouble aiming myself at some of the enemies that I wanted to attack, but I still felt myself getting drawn back into this game. It's truly amazing. The sound and the atmosphere are both perfect. It's very rare that you're going to hear me say that about a game with no music. In fact, it works better without music. Of course I beat the game and it satisfied me. In fact, it satisfied me so much that I never bothered with any of the Dark Souls games at all. This one got a remake for the PlayStation 5 and I'll grab that one after the price drops for sure. Actually, since I made this video, I have picked it up and I am enjoying it a lot. Killzone 3 was released by Sony in 2011. It's a first person shooter and as you may or may not know, I'm not really a fan of this genre. In fact, I've never understood the appeal, at least on a console. If it were third person, I'd like it a lot more. This one controls like any other and it works decently well considering that you can't use a keyboard and mouse. You can use the move controller along with a navigation controller. I don't have a navigation controller, so I can't try that out here. I do remember playing it at a friend's house about a decade ago though, and I don't recall it being very intuitive. But again, that was a long time ago. One nice thing is that this game doesn't make me motion sick at all, despite the less than ideal frame rate. This game also has a 3D mode. I haven't tried that since my friend's house a decade ago. I remember thinking it looked decent in 3D. These days when you try to boot the disc, you'll be greeted with a lengthy black screen. 
After several minutes, this screen will show up and then it will appear to freeze. Just be patient, eventually the game will load. I don't know why it hangs like this, but it'll work eventually. If you like first person shooters and don't mind the lengthy boot up sequence, you may enjoy Killzone 3. Ridge Racer 7 was a launch game for the PlayStation 3. It's Ridge Racer! Ridge Racer! Remember that one? Unfortunately, Namco seems to have phoned this one in. It's very similar to Ridge Racer 6, which was an Xbox 360 launch game. However, this one looks a lot sharper thanks to the native 1080p resolution. The controls also feel a hair more refined in this one compared to Ridge Racer 6. The soundtrack is also different. There's a bit more customization in this game as well. This is another one of those rare games on the system that runs at 1080p and at 60 frames per second. The frame rate will drop sometimes, but not often at all. Also, there are some sound issues, mainly with the enemy car engines. They clip a lot and it sounds pretty bad. No matter how far you turn down the sound in the options, it's still gonna be there. You have nitrous available for a boost and you can earn it by drifting. That means you need to drift a lot because you're not gonna win any other way. So if you hate drifting, this certainly is not the game for you. I like this game a lot, but it's nowhere near as good as Ridge Racers 1 through 5. Sadly, the series would never be the same, and this is the last numbered entry into the series so far. There you go, that was the PlayStation 3 and all of its best games. If it wasn't in this episode, it's a bad game. Now nah, I'm just kidding. There are so many more excellent games that I just don't have. So I may do another one of these episodes in the future. We'll see. As for the system itself, I really enjoyed the PlayStation 3 in its time and even still today. I like the Xbox 360. I like it a lot, but I think that the PS3 just resonated a bit more with me. How about you? What did you think of the console? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Did you know that if you have the original version of Demon Souls for the PlayStation 3 and you have a game save for it on your PlayStation 3, you can play the PlayStation 5 version of Demon Souls on your PlayStation 3 with all of the graphical enhancements intact. No need for this crappy PS3 version anymore. Good riddance. Let's play some Demon Souls. All right, let's see if this works. Come on, come on, I have a game save. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes! Demon Souls, PlayStation 5 quality on your PlayStation 3. Oh, man. forgot how hard this one was. Good, no, I hit you! Cool, you! Yeah, I'll try this level now. No, no, no! I got you! I got you! Try it one more time. Yeah! Eh, didn't want to play Demon Souls anyway. Hello and welcome to GameSack. The first time I played PlayStation VR, I was kind of blown away, so it didn't take me long to jump on board. I figured now would be as good as time as any to show off some games that are available on the console. Well, it's not a console, it's a platform. But first, a short bit about the PlayStation VR itself. The PlayStation VR was launched in October of 2013. The processor box and headset connects to a PlayStation 4 with several wires. A camera is also needed. 
The headset features 5.7 inch OLED screens running at a native 90 or 120 frames per second. It also has a resolution of 960 by 1080 pixels per eye and a 110 degree field of view. Many VR games feature visual performance enhancements when played on a PS4 Pro. The PSVR is also compatible with a PlayStation 5 with a special adapter, but there are no performance increases at all. The end. Yeah, when I said short, I meant short. Anyway, I've got 18 different games to show you in this video, so what are you waiting for? Let's get started. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Wait, that's my job. Here's Res Infinite from Enhance, and it has a physical release from IM8Bit. You don't have to have a PlayStation VR to play this one, but I highly, highly recommend it. As a game, it's pretty simple. Just hold down the button and lock onto up to eight targets and then release your firepower. There are certain items that you get which will fill up your meter in the bottom left. Once it fills, you evolve. The more evolved you are, the more hits you can take before you die. The red items go on the bottom right and basically give you a bomb attack for lack of a better term. Lastly are the cubes. Shoot these to advance deeper into the level. But you may want to hold off on these if you feel there's more to the current level that you want to explore. Eventually you'll get to a boss and, well, you know the drill. There are five different areas in all in the basic game. You can pan your head around to move the cursor to lock onto the enemies, but I really don't recommend playing the game that way. Instead, just use a controller's analog pad like you normally would. It makes the game much more comfortable. The graphics are awesome, yet simple. Give me vectors and flat shaded polygons and I am a happy man. The music is far more impressive as it adds layers to the track the deeper you get into the level. The controller also rumbles to the beat, and it's one of the few times that I don't want to disengage controller vibration. There's also Area X, which is all new. This one forgoes the vectors and flat shaded polygons for colorful particle effects. You can also roam around freely, and it takes a bit of getting used to. It is a fun area to play, though, from time to time. All in all, I've always liked Res, but never again do I want to play this game without VR. The only things I could ask for would be more resolution for sharper lines and to please get rid of the boss rush at the end. Ace Combat 7 Skies Unknown is one of those games that has a few missions specifically for VR. Right away I was in awe as it seemed like I was standing right next to this plane. Well, sitting next to it anyway. Next thing I know I'm in the cockpit and it's so damn cool. I take off and start flying around and of course I'm gonna do some rolls. Oh my, that feels really weird and I'm not sure if I like it. I quickly crashed. But I immediately tried again, and suddenly the weird motion oddness that I was experiencing before was gone. Battling enemies in this mode is super fun, looking for them and just going every which way. No motion sickness at all. I also love how this condensation looks on my canopy, it's incredibly real. I don't care much for the long periods of flying around and boringness between battles, but the battles themselves are great. This is a fantastic bonus if you own the game. Until Dawn, Rush of Blood is the game that actually sold me on VR. This one is a light gun game on rails, literally. Using two move controllers, you can dual wield different weapons as you shoot scary things that are trying to cause you harm on your little roller coaster ride. You can use a normal controller as well if you prefer. It's not uncommon for one of your guns to get a little jittery or cocked in one direction or another, but shaking the controller can alleviate that a bit. The atmosphere in this game is pretty intense, and I love it. It's super fun to shoot things and I really enjoy the imagination of the developers. Not sure what the game has to do with Until Dawn though. This is a pretty bloody game, so if you don't like that, well, you're not gonna like this. Oh, and I urge you to wear headphones when you play this. If you don't, you're really missing out on the immersiveness of this one. Honestly, that can be said for almost all VR games. You want it to sound like you're there too, not just look like it. This one is great fun and it's always the first game I let those who haven't experienced a VR game play. 
They always love it. This is a PlayStation VR exclusive game, and I can't imagine not having this one in my library. Pap, pap, pap goes my Glock. Here's Batman Arkham VR. I recall this one being pretty cheap. In this title, you play as Batman, of course. It's definitely best if you play it standing up, and you'll need a single move controller. Anyway, in this game, you're in detective mode pretty much 100% of the time. There's really not much action for you to participate in. You have to use your tools to investigate and piece together small puzzles. You move around by looking at one of the predetermined points you can stand at and pressing the move button. It was weird for me way back when I first tried VR, but these days it feels pretty natural for a VR game. This title is short, but it's pretty good. I like the part near the end, is this kind of trippy? You'll finish this in no time, but there's still stuff you can do afterwards. Not a whole lot of substance here, but it's a good time while it lasts. Who invited him? Everybody's dad likes golf, right? Well, how about a VR game that's not just for your dad, but for everybody? Another exclusive for the PlayStation VR is Everybody's Golf VR. This isn't the normal Everybody's Golf with a quick VR mode tacked on. It's an entirely new game. I've loved all of the other games in the series, so of course I had to try this one. I like it, though I feel it could be better. You play standing up, or rather, it's definitely best if you do. You can use a move controller or a normal one, but either way you're going to be swinging it, so I recommend the move. The game guides you through a few basics before it begins, naturally. Hitting the ball is both fun and frustrating. You have to stand super far away from the camera so that it can see the light from your move at the top and bottom of your swing, so you need a lot of room for this one. It can also get a little twitchy or sometimes the club isn't being held straight. Again, shaking the move a little can fix this. This is much more realistic than any other game in the series and it also feels really empty compared to those. Still, it can be pretty fun. I like how gigantic the courses feel. The staff at the clubhouse are also really short. Is it that time already? Okay, maybe I shouldn't be such a creepy guy walking around the counter, but hey, it looks like it's really there. I got to see if I can do it. You won't do as well at this game as you do in the other Hot Shots games, but it eases you into it. In the end, I do like it, but only sometimes. <gasps> it's in a bunker. Ah yes, gotta mention Beat Saber. This is a pretty well-known rhythm game that's on all of the different VR platforms. In fact, I first played this years ago on an HTC Vive Pro at Yoshi Vu's place. He's the 3D artist for GameSack, if you didn't know. Basically, you have two differently colored lightsabers that aren't licensed from Lucasfilm, and you need to swipe down the same colored cubes as they come at you to the beat of the music. In addition, you need to swipe the cubes in the direction the arrows point. If that's not enough, you need to step out of the way for all of the incoming walls and sometimes even duck under them. I wish I didn't have to duck quite so far, you really have to crouch. And that's not just this version, I thought the same thing on the HTC Vive Pro. Other than that, this is a super fun and addictive game that anyone can play. You will wander around the room a bit as you play this, so it's good if you have someone there with you to make sure you don't go too far from your original location. The move controllers work well here, and their flaws never become apparent because you're always shaking them, which means they keep behaving. You can get a lot of extra music track add-ons if you're willing to spend the coin. Maybe if they come out with a version with Sega Game Music or Iron Maiden or something. I really wish I could add my own music. I still recommend it anyway. This is PlayStation VR Worlds by London Studio, which is, of course, exclusive to the PlayStation VR. It was also bundled with the VR hardware. This is more or less a series of demos. There's Ocean Descent, where you basically just stand there while you're being lowered into the ocean. 
You just look around and enjoy the show. This one's a good one to show off to your mom who's never experienced VR before because she doesn't have to worry about doing anything. I mean, this is the one I showed my mom and she loved it. Next, there's Danger Ball. Basically, you just use your head to aim the reticle and hit the ball. You need to score five goals before your opponent does. No danger here, or much fun really. Then there's VR Luge. You ride a luge downhill on a street with active traffic, of course. I mean, what fun would an empty street be? You steer by tilting your head, which is the worst idea in a world of bad ideas. It's tough to control and you might get some motion sickness out of it. I didn't, but it's just weird. I don't really recommend it. But if you've got your heart set on motion sickness, then you'll love Scavenger's Odyssey. You make huge jumps from platform to platform in space where direction has no meaning. My stomach can't take much of this. Even when you get inside, it feels pretty bad. I've read that this might be caused by the game only running at 60 frames per second, which is generally considered too low for VR with movement like this, but Sony thinks it's fine. I'm not sure if that's what causes it or not though, that's just what I've read. Don't kill the messenger, and I know you want to. Anyway, I cannot play this title very much. The last game on here is London Heist. This one is story based, kind of. You're a thief who goes in to steal a big old diamond. This is the only game on the disc which allows you to use the move controllers and I recommend that you do if you have them. There's a fun shootout where you're stuck behind a desk. After that, you're in a car and the shooting action is even more fun. I love this. This is by far the best title on the disc. The sad thing is that it's over way too soon, but it's really enjoyable while it lasts. This is Blood and Truth, which is another PlayStation VR exclusive. This game by London Studio basically takes London Heist from VR worlds and expands it with its very own game. And wow, I am so glad that they did because this is awesome. In this one, you play as a fellow named Ryan Marks as he recounts his adventures doing war and secret agent type of stuff. That's how it starts out anyway. You shoot guns, throw grenades, pick locks, pull switches, and lots of other hands-on stuff. You definitely want the move controllers for the best experience, and if you've played London Heist, then you know that's a given. I had a slightly hard time getting things set up, but once I figured everything out, I was good to go and could do anything I needed to very quickly. Nothing here is overly complicated, and that's good. The action scenes are super fun, and you can even move around. Basically, a mark appears somewhere if you can move there. Look at it and press the move button to go there. You can also strafe left and right one space with the X and circle buttons. It actually works pretty well, and it's fairly intuitive. And of course, the driving and shooting segment is back and is just as fun, if not even more so. There's plenty to do in this title. There's lots of story between each action scene, and believe it or not, even that stuff is pretty fun. I like bending the laws of physics as I'm being interrogated. I mean, does he not even see me doing this stuff? Shouldn't he be concerned about reality like I am? How is this happening, sir? Sir? Oh well. The game is quite hard to put down, and if you have a PlayStation VR, this is a must own. I am so glad that I got this one. He's coming for me. He's catching up. Oh God. Don't shoot Ryan. He can lead us. All right, time. all right. Where's Tony? Here's Pixel Ripped 1989. You start out as a dot in some video game land and then chaos happens so you need to invade portable game systems of kids to save your world. Or something like that, the story doesn't really matter much. You need to play your game system in class while simultaneously distracting the teacher because you don't want to get caught. It's a really good idea and it takes advantage of VR but I think they overdid it a little bit. You need to shoot spitballs at the teacher as much as you can while playing the game at the same time. You can't just occasionally distract her here and there, but instead every few seconds, otherwise she catches you, and if she catches you three times, it's game over. And if you pay too much attention to not getting caught, you die in the game. It's just too much to be enjoyable instead of annoying, but I do like the concept. And can the blowing on the cartridge trope just die already, please? The virtual environment is huge, and even the little kids seem like massive giants. At least the music is pretty good. I thought I gave this game a bad rap, so I came back a week later and tried it again with a fresh perspective, and I still don't like it. Great idea, just horrible execution. Oh. 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 
The sequel is called Pixel Ripped 1995. Thankfully, this one is a lot better. It takes place in more of a 16-bit world now. You're playing as the same video game character again and you begin by equipping yourself. You need to use the controller to play the game and not the move. Unfortunately, that makes things like this extremely awkward and more difficult than they need to be. You start off by playing an overhead run and gun which has a lot of inspiration from Zelda. It's not bad at all and it's definitely more interesting than the game you were playing in the first Pixel Ripped. It works kind of like Sonic as as long as you have at least one of the little square thingies you can take a hit without dying. The graphics as you're playing look better and more clear than what you see here, and closer too. All while this is happening, people are distracting you with their nonsense in the house. For some reason, your mom doesn't want you to play video games, like, at all. Weirdo. You have to distract her with a toy gun sometimes, but not every few seconds like you did with the dumb teacher in the first game. Grabbing the gun requires you make your character let go of the controller with the R2 button. It's extremely awkward. If you don't distract your mom enough, she turns off the game console as you're playing. Fortunately, there's a ton of save points and you can just play again and resume from there. This right here makes it infinitely better than the first Pixel Ripped game. Infinitely. Anyway, you keep doing this and distracting your parents until you beat the short main quest of the game. Then the game becomes kind of an augmented reality thing where you're fighting with the game characters on your living room floor. You sometimes have to grab the toy gun to collapse the Jenga towers that the enemy climbs on and I found myself out of the play area and unable to do this quite often. But eventually I got it. Next, you're in a video rental store where you're stuck between a kiosk with two game consoles. They're somehow linked together and you can just play either of them by grabbing the controller. If you grab a power-up on one console's game, you can use it for a limited amount of time on the other console to get past obstacles. Definitely a neat idea. Once again, the music is pretty darned good. I do wish that grabbing objects was mapped to a button instead of motion controlled because your arms can get twisted around and it just doesn't work well at all. Overall, Pixel Ripped 1995 is the one that I recommend. Just skip the first one. What you but I'm telling you anyway, that game is a masterpiece. Yeah, a masterpiece. I don't know about you, but I think the PlayStation VR needs a mascot. No one pays attention to a gaming platform without a mascot. That's why we have Astrobot. This is Astrobot Rescue Mission from Sony. This is another fantastic game that you can only get on the PlayStation VR. You may recognize the little robot guy that you control from the Astrobot game that came with the PlayStation 5. Well, this is his first game. Well, actually it's his second, but I'll get to that. You use the controller in this one to run around the stages. This controls exactly like the PlayStation 5 game with the punches and the jumps. You can also press jump again to fire thrusters to float for a bit, which can damage enemies below you. You go forward through each stage collecting large and small coins as well as rescuing other robot friends who are stranded. Just walk up to them and give them a good smack and they'll go straight into your controller. You really want to rescue as many of these guys as you can, otherwise future levels won't unlock. Many of them are hidden pretty well, so you really have to take your time and explore everywhere if you want to get them all. Sometimes your controller will be modified and you can use it as a tool by using the big old rectangle button in the middle of it. This of course adds some motion control to the game, but for something like this, I don't mind at all since it's handled really well. For example, you can use a rope to pull out walls to advance. Or the little robot can walk on the rope that you shoot and you swing the controller up to send him flying into the air to grab stuff that's usually well out of his reach. Sometimes you even have to use your head to bash things out of the way. Of course, there are boss fights and these are really fun and often kind of intense. In these, you have heart icons next to you which means you can take three hits before you die instead of the usual one hit. Speaking of dying, there are lots of checkpoints throughout each area so you won't go back too terribly far if and when you die. You do have unlimited lives though since this is a modern game. Sometimes you have to blow and that's really the only thing that I don't think works very well at all. There's stuff hidden everywhere in this game, above you, below you, even behind you. The first few times I played this it made my neck really sore trying to see everything. Of course I was sitting on my couch. But I found that if you sit in a chair that swivels like an office chair it makes the game much more comfortable physically. You still sometimes have to move your head to peer around a corner so you can see but I never had any aches when using my office chair. The graphics are amazing and everything looks and feels very solid. There's tons of colors and crazy designs everywhere. 
The sound and music are also both great. If you listen, you can hear your friends that you need to rescue, and their yells come from the direction that they're hidden, so that definitely helps. Once again, I recommend headphones for sure. Most of the music tracks are excellent, with only one or two mediocre tunes. If you have a PlayStation VR, you really need this one in your collection. Yeah, you can suck at HTC Vive owners, or Oculus owners, or Facebook VR owners. Actually, you guys probably don't care. Speaking of Astrobot, there's also the Playroom VR, which is free to download. This is basically another tech demo for the PlayStation VR, but it can still be pretty fun. This is where Astrobot made his very first appearance. And you thought he showed up first on the PlayStation 5, you're so silly. This stage plays just like Rescue Mission, but you can tell it's a lot earlier as some things don't work quite as smoothly as that game. This is still really fun though, and its popularity resulted in Rescue Mission being made. I mean, I guess, I don't know how Sony works. There are also other games in here which take advantage of multiple players. In this stage, for example, the person in the VR headset is smashing buildings with his head while the players look at the TV and run away. I can't show you what the headset sees here. You can only see me as a monster bashing buildings with my head. My point of view is from the monster. At the end of this short stage, the players looking at the TV need to throw stuff at the person with the VR headset, and they need to dodge the objects that are being thrown. It's almost like playing a really weird LAN game or something or this one where you enter a haunted house. The people looking at the TV see the same thing as the person wearing the headset does, but the headset doesn't see the ghosts. As you shine your flashlight around, people need to yell at you to tell you how close you are to capture the ghosts. It's kind of neat, actually. Since this title is meant to be viewed on the TV simultaneously by other people, it seems to be one of the few, if not the only game that fills the TV screen entirely as you play. As you may or may not have noticed, all the other games have black bars on the side. None of the two-player mechanics here ended up moving on to Astrobot Rescue Mission. The Playroom VR is short, but fun. There's a joke there, but I ain't doing it. Wipeout Omega Collection was updated to support VR. You can now play the entire game this way. If you're like me, the first thought you have upon learning this is wondering how much motion sickness is involved. Well, when I first started playing this, it definitely felt a little weird. Not sick, just weird. It did get a little bit better, but I was never able to entirely shake the weird feeling. Granted, the way the Wipeout games float around and bob and weave and bounce has never made me feel totally comfortable since the day the series was introduced. But that's just me. Actually, it probably isn't. Anyway, everything looks great as it's all life-size, meaning these racing vehicles are actually quite large. Definitely bigger than they look on a 2D screen. Looking into a turn as you race helps a bit with lessening the weirdness. As a game, it's fantastic, with three different Wipeout games all prettied up for the PlayStation 4 here. Tons of content in this one. Unfortunately, after I ended the game, I did need to lie down for a bit because I felt a tad dizzy, but then again, I was kind of tired already when I started playing this game anyway. But I wouldn't recommend playing this for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time if you feel a bit weird, otherwise motion sickness may set in. There are a few things you can do to reduce the chance of motion sickness, but I didn't try any of that. I'm a man, I'll take my vomit with pride! Here's Job Simulator from Alchemy Labs. This is one that people talk about a lot when it comes to VR experiences, or at least they used to. This requires both move controllers. You start out by picking one of four human jobs to do. There's the office, a chef, a convenience store clerk, and a mechanic. Each job places you in a space with lots of stuff for you to interact with. Basically, the jobs that you do are simulations by the robots of what they think humans used to do. 
As a human, they're just trying to make you feel at home, I guess. Of course, none of these jobs are accurate and it's all basically a parody. A bulletin board that's nearby tells you how to accomplish each goal. Once you do everything needed, you pull another paper or ticket or whatever and move on to the next task. Since it's a parody, it can be pretty funny and entertaining. Could I also get one of those meat cylinders, please? Hot dogs are in the freezer. Make sure you heat them up, at least a little bit. My favorite job is the mechanic. You cheat customers out of cash and even help some criminals in addition to your normal duties. Also, this one has a radio that you listen to with songs that the robots think you'll enjoy. And I do enjoy them, even though there's only two songs in a few talk radio stations. The virtual environment is a bit too large, so you'll have to reach high, low, and far in order to access everything. It's very difficult to set up properly at the beginning. I'm not sure if standing or sitting works best. Either way, I found myself moving out of the play area sometimes as the game just demands too much range of motion from you. Yes, even if you stand where they tell you to stand in the beginning. Sometimes the game will mess up. Like here, I sold this robot some stuff at the store and took her money. Now I have to give her the change, but she didn't take it and it fell over the counter. If I bend over the counter, I can see it, but there's no way I can get it. The coin doesn't reappear on the counter for me to give it to her and there's no way I can complete the task or progress in the game. So yes, it can be kind of buggy. And yes, it can definitely be enjoyable and somewhat funny, but once you do all or even half of the tasks in each job, it starts to get a little boring. There's not a ton of replayability here. It's fun to let people who are new to VR try it, but even they'll get bored after a bit. It's an interesting concept, but it's certainly no legend in its own time like some people make it out to be. Thanks, human. I'll get this squared away uh, later. You're the best. I really like how VR puts you into the game. It's like you're actually there. It's so incredibly immersive. So it's reasonable to assume that a scary game would be even scarier in VR. Resident Evil 7 is available on many platforms, but it can only be played in VR on the PlayStation VR. You can play the entire game this way. I first played this in regular old 2D, figuring that I didn't want to wear this ridiculous helmet the entire time. But I tell you, it's really cool playing this in VR, especially if you start from the beginning. You use the regular controller here, and there's no motion sensing anywhere other than just turning your head. Moving around is pretty simple, and you snap your view 30 degrees in either direction with the right analog stick. This is kind of weird at first. Actually, it is kind of a bit off-putting throughout, but you do learn to tolerate it. As a game, it's pretty creepy with some gross ambience. Somebody call a maid, maybe two. You're off to find your missing wife. It doesn't take long before you do. As you're trying to escape, you discover that she's pretty cray-cray. The video you're looking at here appears a touch darker than it seems to be when you're wearing the headset. Things are clear and easy to make out most of the time. Playing in VR does reveal that a lot of textures are flat that you wouldn't notice if you were playing in 2D. The shadow edge detail is also a lot worse in VR compared to when you're playing it normally. But otherwise, it looks damn fine. Unless you're really slow, you've probably noticed that this game is in a first-person perspective. This game was clearly made with VR in mind. There are plenty of times where someone will try to stick something right in your face or your eyes. I think perhaps they get a bit too close, but it's still a fun effect. Also, I really need to mention the binaural audio. Hearing the creepy ass sounds throughout the house while you're in VR is amazing. Capcom did an absolutely excellent job with the VR presentation here. Sometimes the game will snap back to 2D for a cutscene or part of a cutscene, but it doesn't detract from the overall experience. If you haven't played through this game before and you have a PlayStation VR, try playing the game for the first time from the beginning in VR mode. It'll be even creepier that way.
Here's a game called Moss, and it's from Polyarch. In this one, you're a being who directly controls a mouse. She can jump, shimmy ledges, and swing her sword. This is a puzzle game, and the goal is to get her from the entrance of a screen to its exit. As a super being called a reader, you can also move shiny objects around using motion controls. And if these shiny things are in a stage, chances are you need to move them at least once. The game is fun and inventive, but generally I don't have much interest in puzzle games. But I still did find a lot to enjoy here. Fighting enemies can be fun. As a reader, you can also pick up and control some enemies. The story is told by someone who's reading a book and I really don't care for that part as the same person does all the voices and it sounds like I'm a child being read to. I mean, that's obviously exactly what they're trying to portray, but I just don't find it endearing or entertaining. Suffice it to say, you're on a journey to catch up to your uncle or something. This is such a strange land that you travel through with so many puzzles and traps. It can be easy to die, but as a reader, you can also heal the mouse before she dies. I admit that some puzzles can seem really tough at first, but mostly because you can't see everything. Even if you move your head around, it can be tough to see all of the little passageways and whatnot. There's no scrolling or movement of any kind, but sometimes the screen you're looking at will pulse or breathe back and forth and it's kind of odd. I'm sure this is probably more of a PSVR problem than a moss problem. The graphics are really nice with a ton of depth, and the music is fitting. If this looks like fun to you, then give it a go. You'll find a nice brain-teasing adventure. This one is called Derasane. Wait, that can't be right. It's gotta be pronounced Derasane. Sounds like you need a prescription for it. This game is by From Software and it's a PlayStation VR exclusive and you'll need the move controllers for it. It kind of plays like a point and click adventure game. That's good, I love point and click adventure games. You play as a fairy trying to prove your existence, at least from what I gather. It's all very strange. The movement is kind of odd as you have to press the tiny buttons on the move to rotate and then there are other buttons for crouching and actually moving. If you're standing next to a person or an important object, the direction of the rotating buttons change for some reason. Why? Still, it almost becomes second nature after a while. Basically, time is standing still for everyone but you. You can store time by stealing life from grapes or whatever and then use the time on things so that they do something. You can interact with some items, but not many. One nice thing, though, is that you can pet the dog, even if the dog doesn't know it because time is standing still. Oh, look, I wonder if you can pet the kitty cat. <coughs> yeah, I guess not. Yikes. The first real mission has you trying to find a bunch of herbs that the kids have hidden to place in the stew. Some of the vials with the herbs in them you can see and even grab, but you can't take them with you for some reason without doing something else first. Same goes for this key, which I need it to open a box upstairs. It became boring as I felt I had looked everywhere like four or five times and it just wasn't fun exploring anymore. Honestly, I feel this one would be a lot better if it weren't a VR game, mainly because I want to relax as I explore and I can't really do that while wearing all of this gear and holding these controllers. A lot of people love this one for some reason. Don't get mad because I don't. <gasps> Is the fairy come to play? Last up is Farpoint from Impulse Gear. This is exclusive to the PlayStation VR. It's also a first person shooter. Unfortunately, the game only uses one save file and you can't start over, so I have to start where I left off. I wish the PlayStation 4 had a hard drive or something so that more than one game save could exist, but that kind of technology is probably decades away. What do I know though? Anyway, basically the premise is that you crash land on some planet, as did some of your co-workers. Along the way, you can scan some of their residual memories or something like that and see what they did before you got there. I forget exactly what's going on because it's been quite some time since I played this. But mainly, you keep walking and shooting the same enemies over and over. Not to say that this is bad, quite the contrary. It's actually very good. You'd think that you could use the move controller, but no. The game needs you to use two analog sticks to move around. You can use an aim controller, but those are rather expensive. The controller still works pretty well though. 
The very first time I played this, I didn't like it at all because I couldn't turn, like at all. It made the angles and stuff extremely awkward. I don't know why, but it defaults this way in the options. Once I turned the turn on, I enjoyed this game a ton more. I'm not sure why having that off is even an option. Anyway, using the right analog stick, you snap a few degrees in either direction, similar to Resident Evil 7. Again, you really do need this on to enjoy the game at all. The aiming and shooting works quite well, and I like how the gun sight works just like a real gun from outer space. What I don't like is all the spidery creatures that go straight for your face. There are trillions of these things, and they get annoying pretty fast. In fact, they didn't remain fun for very long at all. The designers apparently love them like nothing else, but I sure don't. Aside from this, the game is pretty enjoyable, and you should definitely check it out. And there you go, that's a handful of games that are available on the PlayStation VR. You know, I mostly love the system and I'm really excited to see what Sony has up their sleeve for the second generation of VR coming for the PlayStation 5. And yes, I'm sure that HTC Vive and Oculus or whatever are a trillion times better and I should just shoot myself for daring to play on a console. Anyway, what other games should I play on the PlayStation VR? Let me know, in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Sir, if you could just fill this out in triplicate and get that back to me, I'll be able to help you out. What's this? I owe the IRS 14,000 more dollars! <sighs> Screw this, video games are way too realistic. Hello and welcome to GameSack. Analog is back with another system, this time to cater to lovers of handheld games and is finally releasing here at the end of 2021. It's called The Pocket and it retails for $199 US dollars. $200 for this? Well, let's check it out. On its own, The Pocket lets you play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games using FPGA cores. With some optional adapters, you'll eventually be able to play Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket Color, and Atari Lynx games. It has a 3.5 inch LCD screen with a resolution of 1600 by 1440. That's pretty high, and you may be wondering why use a screen with such resolution for the types of games that it plays. I'll get to that in a bit. Regardless, the screen quality is quite good and everything looks very sharp. There are four unlabeled buttons on the face of the unit, two of them concave and the other two convex, just like the Super Nintendo controller in North America. Not everyone's gonna agree, but I actually really like that. The D-pad isn't as tight as you'd find on, say, a Game Boy or Game Boy Color, but again, I really like this D-pad. It and the buttons are super easy to press. It does have a hair more travel, so that may or may not affect Tetris champions. I'm no champion, so I couldn't tell you. All I know is that I like it. There are also two shoulder buttons on the back of the unit. These feel okay, but are perhaps a touch small. That's what she said. There's also three super tiny buttons towards the bottom middle of the unit. The left one is concave and acts as the select button. The middle one is the analog button, which you use for the menu and other features, and the right one is convex and acts as start. 
On the left side, you've got your volume up and down buttons as well as the green power slash standby button. The cartridge slot isn't actually much of a slot as the connector is right there at the top without a dust flap or what have you. You'd think that the cartridge wouldn't be very secure, but it actually feels really tight in there without much wobble. Again, that's what she said. Sorry. Your fingers can sometimes touch the cartridge when pressing the shoulder buttons if you're not careful, but so far it hasn't jostled the card enough to cause any glitches. There's also a slot for a micro SD card that can be used for various things, but Analog says it needs to be formatted to FAT32. Anyone remember FAT32? I tried using a card formatted for XFAT to update the firmware because F the police. It worked fine, but Analog says they want FAT32, so do this at your own risk, I guess. It also comes with a USB-C cable for charging. Analog states that the typical battery life is about 6 hours if you keep the screen at the default 75% brightness. Mine was 50% charged when I got it, and it took quite a bit of use before it finally died. I'd say that Analog's estimate is pretty close. Powering it up, you're greeted with a menu. The first item lets you play whatever cartridge you have plugged in. But the selection I'm interested in talking about now, of course, is the settings. Under Systems, you can select one of the four systems currently supported and adjust various options. In here, you can play with the video, audio, control, and hardware settings. Under Video, you have your choice of different color palettes and display modes. That's right, I said palettes. Anyway, for example, selecting Original DMG under Game Boy gives you a look that's pretty close to the original Game Boy, just without the blur as the screen scrolls. This is where the super high resolution screen comes in, as it can now draw a very convincing LCD grid pattern as needed, and I've got to say that it looks incredible. You can also select from different hardware models to mimic their look as well, or just keep it all turned off. The screen runs at the exact refresh rate of whatever system you're playing a game on. See, I didn't need 20 minutes to explain resolution and refresh rates like some channels. The frame blending option is really interesting. For example, this stage in Castlevania 2 on Game Boy has mountains that flicker in the windows. If you turn the frame blending mode on, they no longer flicker at all. This can even help you with fake transparencies like in the F-Zero games on the Game Boy Advance where the map normally flickers. Not anymore. For the sharpness, I'd advise keeping it cranked all the way up because lowering it will blur the screen, but hey, that's up to you. The size and position settings let you adjust the screen to your whimsy, but I think the default settings are pretty awesome, even if they don't fill the entire screen. For example, the Game Boy Advance is wider than the original Game Boy, so that's why it's letterboxed here. Each Nintendo Portable has a Super Game Boy Control option, thankfully, so that in effect, jump is B and attack is Y, for lack of better description. It's just how it should be. Under the hardware option, you can find various things. You can force GB mode under Game Boy so that the game thinks it's running on a Game Boy and not a Game Boy Color. On the Game Boy Color, you can select Run as GBA so the few games that have enhancements when run on a Game Boy Advance will take advantage of them. Unfortunately, graphical and sound enhancements for the Super Game Boy aren't currently supported. Hopefully, that comes in a future firmware update. Lastly, for the Game Boy Advance, you can enable a high quality mode under the audio. This seems to be a low-pass filter to take out some of the typical scratchiness the GBA is known for. Unfortunately, it also makes it quite a bit more quiet, so you'll have to turn it up. Anyway, for an example, here's one of the scratchiest sounding Game Boy games that I can think of, Castlevania Circle of the Moon. All in all, there are plenty of options here, and although I'm not usually a big fan of handhelds, I do like what this one brings to the table, and there seem to be plenty of options to get everything looking and sounding how you want it. There are also tools you can use, which I'm not truly equipped to review very well. Nano Loop here allows you to make some music with the device. Create yourself some rock and beats like I'm doing here. Your talent is the only limit, and mine is quite limited at this time. GB Studio allows you to make homebrew games with the help of a PC app, or at least I think. Here's an example of a game called Daedalus that someone else made with GB Studio. Maybe you can do this too. Playing the games here is generally a good experience. You can press the analog button during gameplay to get to the menu to adjust things, but keep in mind that this does not pause the game. Be sure to pause it in-game before you press it. You can tap the green power button to put it into sleep mode. You can even remove the cartridge from the system, put it back in, and you're good to go when you tap it again to wake it up. This makes me think that it would be somewhat trivial to add save stage, which I'm sure is coming in a future firmware. 
The newest firmware now has a beta save state feature where you can save your state by pressing the analog button and up to save your state and analog and down to load it. Only one save state can happen at a time and if you power the pocket down, it goes away. I'd like to see this updated so that it writes the save states to the SD card if possible. Still, it's pretty crazy to be able to do this with a real cartridge and not a flash card. The Pocket can even run EverDrive cartridges just fine, which is great. However, the sleep function does not work with flash cards. The games all seem to run great so far with faithful video and sound. I did encounter some audio issues with Metroid Zero Mission, but they already had a new firmware update that seems to have fixed this before I could even report it. So be sure to update your firmware. Okay, now I've seen most of the capabilities and performance of the basic unit. It's amazing this thing only costs $199 and has a screen of this caliber. But wait, there's some optional accessories that you can get that I want to show you. I think this might be how analog makes up some of the cost of the pocket. First up, let's check out the Game Gear Adapter, which is already available for $30. I'm rounding up a penny on these prices, by the way. If you're incredibly smart, you've already figured out that this lets you play Game Gear games on the Pocket. And it does so quite well. The default screen looks bright and colorful. You can change the screen to the Original GG or Original GG+. This gives you the LCD grid and it looks kind of washed out, but nowhere near as bad as the original Game Gear screen. The only bad thing, if you can even call it that, is that the cartridge sticks up higher than the unit itself. Unfortunately, there aren't any options for the controls here yet, so you jump and attack with the equivalent of the B and A buttons. This makes me sad as it just doesn't feel right, but I'm sure they'll fix it, right? Beyond that though, it looks and sounds fantastic. It's nice to finally be able to play the Game Gear on something with a decent screen without having to mod the original clunky unit. One thing you may want to keep in mind for now is that if you use a Master Gear adapter or play a game like Castle of Illusion that runs in Master System mode, the screen will be too big and cropped. I don't own any of that stuff though, so you'll have to check out My Life in Gaming's video. <sighs> I'm sure this will be fixed sometime in the future though. There's also a screen protector that you can get that's made of tempered glass for $16. It even comes with a wet and dry cloth for installation and upkeep. You can also get a transparent hard plastic case to transport your pocket around. This will set you back $30. There are also several MIDI cables you can use with the Nano Loop app that's built in. These are $20 each and you can get a pocket to MIDI in cable, a pocket to MIDI USB A cable, and a pocket to analog sync cable. You can also get a link cable for head to head gameplay. Analog seems to be pretty serious about the music making capabilities of the pocket that go far beyond what I showed you earlier. This is super cool and I'm curious to hear what kinds of music people are able to make with all of this stuff. Last up is the dock. This will cost you an extra $100, but for me it's essential. What does it do? Well, simply put, it charges your pocket when you set it on it. Isn't that incredible? We are truly living in the future. Oh wait, I guess it does have some other minor features that I should mention. It has an HDMI connector so that you can play your games on the big screen in 1080p. That's really awesome, and it makes the games easier and more comfortable to play, at least for me. You can also connect controllers via USB or even wirelessly. So far, I've had the best luck using a PlayStation 4 controller. In the menu, you can go in and see that there's a grayed out option that you can't select for button mapping that will be available in the future. I can't wait but the PlayStation 4 controller's configuration mirrors the pocket itself pretty well. Still, I'd absolutely love to be able to hook up my Sega Astro City mini controller to the USB port and map it. Right now, the firmware for the dock, which has its own firmware, mind you, is pretty basic. Before you start the game, you can play with most of the normal options you can in portable mode. However, you can't engage the display filters like the LCD overlays. I hope that they add these in the near future because I think they'd look great on my TV as well. Frame blending mode can't be engaged yet either. It also doesn't currently work with Analog's DAC thingy, so you can't output the video to your CRT. But hey, who knows what the future holds. You can adjust the size and position, but since you can't currently call up the menu while the game is running, you need to do it all blind before you play the game. The default setting has the game fill the screen vertically. 
However, you can set the size to perfect integer scales. 7x for the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Gear, and 6x for the Game Boy Advance. These will all give you a slight black border on screen. Even though it's pretty basic right now, the games all still run great via HDMI. The Super Game Boy Enhanced games still play in regular Game Boy mode here for now, but at least the Super Game Boy controls carry over. Except for the Game Gear, of course. The weirdest thing about this is that Analog wants you to physically remove the pocket from the dock anytime you want to change cartridges and then reinsert it and power the pocket back on. Still, I can't wait to finally be able to play my Neo Geo Pocket Color cartridges on the big screen. Another thing I want to say about the pocket is that when you update the firmware, you don't have to reset all of your preferences. Oh god, thank you! All in all, I feel that the pocket really delivers. Usually these things are pretty buggy when they're first released, but right now there are no glaring issues. Sure, some features still need to be added, and they will be, but what we have here is already really good. So is this thing worth $200? Uh, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really up to you, but I sure think it is. Of course, the optional accessories definitely do add to the cost, but maybe you don't want all of those. Maybe you don't want any of them. For me, the dock is essential, as are the various cartridge adapters for the other systems. And once this thing gets jailbroken, it's gonna run cores from all sorts of different platforms. So who knows? Anyway, are you thinking of getting a pocket? What do you think of it? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Who needs this thing when we can have the best portable system? The VR Troopers Game Wizard! Marvel at AAA titles like Ryan's Challenge! Wow, Ryan, you are challenging! Or step up to the pinnacle of entertainment, Jeb's Rescue! Hold on, Jeb, I'm gonna rescue you. I'm gonna rescue you real good like you'll see. Get the VR Troopers Game Wizard today! Yeah, I don't think so. Hello and welcome to GameSack. In this episode, I'm going to be taking a look at the Evercade VS or Versus console from Blaze Entertainment. Now, you may or may not recall I talked about the original Evercade portable system in a couple of different episodes. Well, now it's in a home console form factor, which is way more up my alley. Of course, this plays all of the same cartridges as the Evercade portable, but it's just in a form factor now that's a lot more convenient to deal with, at least in my opinion. Anyway, let's take a look at this thing. Here it is, the Evercade Versus. Inside the box, you'll find the medium-sized console itself. Below that are the two included game cartridges, the Data East Arcade 1 and Technos Arcade 1 collections. These contain a total of 18 different games. Below that, you get two USB controllers with extra long cores that use the same button configuration and D-pad that you'll find on the original Evercade portable system. Oh, and also a USB power cable, but no AC plug adapter. The console itself has four USB slots for controllers. There's also a power button, which not only turns the unit on, but off as well. You need to hold it for half a second to turn it on. It has a little USB jack for your power, an HDMI jack which allows 1080p video, and a button that you can press when you're bored. It's supposed to be a reset button, but it's only active in some games. Most curiously, you have two separate cartridge ports underneath the lid on the front, labeled 1 and 2. That's right, you can load two carts at once, and if you do, then all of the games from both will be listed in alphabetical order on the menu screen, unless you sort them. Let's go over a few of the features of the Evercade Versus before we get into all the new games I want to show you. In the Preferences, under the Display option, you can choose a few different aspect ratios. Pixel Perfect is as sharp as you're going to get. It's a lot better than the HDMI out on the original Evercade Portable. Here's the arcade version of Double Dragon 2 on the original Evercade, which only output up to 720p. 
And here's the same game on the Evercade Versus. Now the difference may seem subtle to you or maybe even not noticeable at all depending on how you're watching this video, but I certainly appreciate the 1080p output and the extra sharpness. You can also add subtle scan lines or even strong scan lines. Under the bezels option are several different wallpapers to choose from and thankfully you can choose none as well. The theme is basically just how the main menu looks. Under sound, you can adjust the overall volume for the system. The network allows you to connect to your local Wi-Fi. Accessibility offers a high contrast mode, but only for the console menu. Language allows you to choose different languages for the menu as you'd probably imagine. System lets you check for updates over Wi-Fi, which is really nice. You can also factory reset all of the options. Map controller lets you assign any and all of the buttons on the controller to do whatever you want. This is kind of a hacky workaround to some of the cartridges having less than ideal button mapping, and a lot of them have less than ideal button mapping. This is really weird, but at least the option is there. Legal and support is an option that you'll likely never select, but it's gotta be there to cover their asses. Credits lists all of the people including the crowdfunding backers. And finally, secret allows you to put in a code that you get from somewhere to do who knows what. It's a secret. During gameplay, you can press the menu button on the controller for a few different options. You have a quick save and a quick load for save states. Or you can just go down to the regular save and load and choose from six different slots which give you a preview of where the save is. You can also look at, but not adjust, the controls. But you know what though? Some of the older ones will let you adjust the controls, but not the new cartridges. What's up with that? Maybe a firmware update can fix this? In some games, like Gate of Doom, these are inaccurate as Start doesn't pause the game and it doesn't tell you what the action buttons are. You can also adjust the display options in the same manner as the console preferences. Finally, you can quit the game and exit out to the game's menu. The controllers themselves feel mostly fine to me. You do have more shoulder buttons now than the original Evercade, which is interesting. Like I said before, I like having a console version as portability isn't really important to me, but the unit is small enough to take it over to your friend's house if you really want to. Okay, so let's take a look at a bunch of new cartridges for the Evercade. That's right, I came back on camera just to say that. Gotta remind you who I am, I guess. Wish someone would remind me of who I am. Let's start with the games that are included with the console. First up is Data East Arcade 1, which has 10 games. Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja, Breakthrough, Burger Time, Chain Reaction, Darwin 4078, Gate of Doom aka Darkseal, Lock and Chase, Sly Spy, Tumble Pop, and Wizard Fire aka Darkseal 2. I <sighs> almost ran out of breath there. I really like Bad Dudes, it's so much more enjoyable than the NES version. The button mapping on this one is far from ideal, but fortunately it doesn't matter a whole lot in a game like this. Still, I don't think that the people making the software for the Evercade will ever understand button mapping. Breakthrough is an interesting game where you have a car that shoots and jumps while the screen scrolls along. Unfortunately, it's just way too choppy to be very playable. I mean, look at that. Burger Time is basically just the arcade version of Burger Time. Not much more to say. It looks pretty sharp. Chain Reaction is an interesting take on Bust a Move style games. Here, you can take shapes and then throw them at matching shapes to make them disappear. I like it, but the stage never seems to end and nothing really happened, so I ended up getting kind of bored. Darwin 4078 is a vertical shooter where you evolve your ship. I have the Mega Drive version, which takes place three years later in 4081. I like that one a lot more than this, though that one isn't outstanding or anything. It's kind of tough to see what's going on with this one. Gate of Doom has you roaming around an isometric world ruining lots and lots of bad guys. This one's pretty fun, if a little rough. Lock and Chase is a Pac-Man clone that succeeds in its goal of making a far worse version of Pac-Man. Sly Spy is one of the more interesting games here. It's a Data East take on Rolling Thunder and Shinobi, and it would be really fun if not for two things. First is the chunky scrolling, which is very hard on the eyes. The newest firmware does fix this somewhat, though, in pixel perfect mode. Next, the run and jump buttons are mapped to A and B, plus they're backwards. You can change this in the console's menu, but then they change for every game if you do that. Whoever creates these cartridges really needs a talking to. Then there's Tumble Pop. 
This is a cool little single screen game where you suck up enemies and then toss them out. It plays similar to most single screen arcades of this type, not bad. The last game is Wizard Fire. This is the sequel to Gate of Doom and it has much better graphics and audio. It's also pretty fun and it's a great follow up. I'm glad both games are on here. Next is Technos Arcade 1 with Battle Lane Volume 5, Blockout, Double Dragon 2, Double Dragon 3, Mania Challenge, Minky Monkey, Mysterious Stones, and the Comba Tribes. Combat Tribes? I don't know. Battle Lane Volume 5 reminds me of Action Fighter or Spy Hunter with you on a motorcycle shooting up screen. It's not horrible and of course it's a bit choppy. It's also really difficult so it'll take a lot of practice. Where are Volumes 1 through 4 of this epic saga? Blackout is basically like a 3D Tetris. Rotate the blocks and place them. I think this one's also on the Genesis. I don't like it. Double Dragon 2 is pretty insane. The enemies are all over you and never let up. At least they got the button mapping correct on this one. The X button attacks left, the B attacks right, and the A button in the middle jumps. It's hard as hell and nowhere near as good as the NES version. Double Dragon 3 is definitely the worst of the arcade beat-em-ups. Look how choppy the sprites move. The collision detection isn't so hot either. The button mapping in this one is awful. You may be wondering where the first Double Dragon is. Blaze said that they didn't put it on here because of all of the slowdown that's naturally in that arcade game which they wanted to fix, but couldn't. Mania Challenge is an ancient wrestling game that's okay, I guess. Not a lot of moves that I can figure out anyway. Minky Monkey has you climbing ropes moving fruit up and down, but good luck because there's a monkey that's always right on your ass and if he touches you, you die. Stupid Outbreak Monkey. Mysterious Stones has you playing the role of an Indiana Jones type character. This really isn't my type of game, but hey, maybe you'll like it. Finally, we have Combat Tribes, or Combat Tribes. This is the most interesting game on the cartridge. It's an odd looking and odd playing beat em up, but it's fun and I definitely like it. The levels mainly have you moving back and forth until you beat all of the enemies and then you fight the boss, which may open up more of the level as you do so. Not bad. I think the reason for the choppy scrolling in the arcade games is because, well, a lot of arcade games have different frame rates than modern televisions. It would be nice to have the ability to slightly speed up or slow down the gameplay so it could more match what you know we can see on modern TVs, kind of like MAME does. Now I'm not sure if this can be addressed in a firmware update or not. Anyway, I've got 10 more cartridges to show you with 101 games among them. I'm not going to cover each and every individual title, but I'll show you each cartridge so you can get an idea of what they're about. This is Galeco Arcade 1. Galeco is a Spanish arcade developer. This one has six games with Alligator Hunt, Biomechanical Toy, Glass, Snowboard Championship, Thunder Hoop, and World Rally. I've never heard of any of these games before, much less actually played them, so this cartridge is kind of a treat. None of the games here are bad, though some are certainly better than others. World Rally has some choppy scrolling, but this is as bad as it gets. The newest firmware seems to have fixed the scrolling in pixel perfect mode, and as a result it's now my favorite game on the cartridge. I love it. I like Alligator Hunt's take on Cabal style gameplay, and Biomechanical Toy is a fairly good run and gun slash platformer. This is definitely a recommended cartridge. This is the Atari Arcade 1 collection, which has arcade games by Atari, of course. You get 13 games here. Asteroids Deluxe, Canyon Bomber, Centipede, Crystal Castles, Liberator, Lunar Lander, Millipede, Missile Command, Night Driver, Pong, Skydiver, Super Breakout, and Warlords. These are extremely early games, and as a result, this cartridge might not have a lot of appeal to most people. Many of the games used trackballs or rotary paddles in the arcade, and it's super tough to play them here with the D-pad, especially when the movement seems to be so fast. It can be really tough to control. Maybe they could add compatibility for various USB rotary paddles and trackballs and whatnot. But hey, who doesn't want to play a really crappy version of Pong? 
I'd definitely pass on this cart, though. I've got to say that Lunar Lander is pretty fun. Next up is Jalico Collection 1 with 10 games included as Styanax, Bases Loaded, Brawl Brothers, City Connection, Earth Defense Force, Operation Logic Bomb, Rival Turf, Super Goal 2, The Ignition Factor, and Totally Rad. There are a couple of decent beat-em-ups on this one as well as a couple of good NES games. The good news is that they mapped the controller correctly for the Super Nintendo games, though of course the button labels themselves are different, but that's okay. Unfortunately, they ignore the X button for everything else, and you jump with the controller's B button. Again, I just don't understand why they can't figure out that people want to jump with the controller's bottom button and attack with the left button on the diamond configuration. Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, and hell, even Sega figured this all out immediately. Why can't Blaze? Remapping via the Evercade OS is kind of a mess, and you have to change it back if you want to play the Super Nintendo games. Why can't I change it on a per-game basis here? Otherwise, this collection isn't bad. Here's Pico Collection 2 with 13 old IPs that Pico swallowed up like Beast Ball, aka Brutal Sports Football, Eliminator Boat Duel, Football Madness, Full Throttle, Hoops Shut Up and Jam 1 and 2, no Charles Barkley here, Power Football, aka Mike Dicka Power Football, Racing Fever, Soccer Kid, Summer Challenge, Top Racer 2, Winter Challenge, and World Trophy Soccer. If you're into mid-tier sports games, you might enjoy this. I don't recall Power Football having music when I rented it, but it has it here. Maybe there's a toggle somewhere. I didn't play long enough to find out. There's a few racing games here as well, and the most interesting one is definitely Racing Fever. Overall, I've got to say that this cart didn't do much for me other than Racing Fever. Next is Indie Heroes with 14 games. Alien Cat 2, Anguna, Chain Break, Deadius, Debtor, Doodle World, Flea, Foxyland, Kubo 3, Ployed, Quest Arrest, Super Homebrew War, Twin Dragons, and Akuzen. As you can imagine, most of these are very simple games based on NES or Game Boy hardware. In fact, this cartridge is likely the only physical release for the great majority of these titles. Some of the games aren't bad, like Foxy Land, which is based on Genesis hardware. Don't get me wrong, it's not super deep either. I don't care for the way some of the slimes move in Naguna, which makes them extremely difficult to hit. Their randomness is very off-putting. Still, if you're into simple indie games, this might be a good one for you to check out. <laughs> Here's Worms Collection 1. Really? There's going to be a part 2? This has Worms, Worms Armageddon, and Worms Blast. I've never been interested in the Worms games, but if you are, then you're going to enjoy this. The only thing interesting to me here is that Worms Armageddon is a PlayStation game and the FMV and the audio seem to work pretty well. Otherwise, it's just Worms. Next is Codemasters Collection 1 with 17 games. On here is B-52, Big Nose Freaks Out, Big Nose the Caveman, Boomerang Kid, CJ's Elephant Antics, Cannon Fodder, Cosmic Spacehead, F-16 Renegade, Linus Spacehead, Megalomania, MiG-29 Soviet Fighter, Psycho Pinball, Sensible Soccer, Stunt Buggies, Super Skid Marks, Tennis All-Stars, and The Ultimate Stunt Man. There are a lot of games on here, and of course they're of varying quality. I never really got much into the Codemasters stuff myself. That's not to say that there aren't some fun titles on here, but I really do think you'll enjoy this one a lot more if you happen to be British. If you're not, approach with caution. A few of these titles are going to have some of the worst audio you'll ever hear. This one is Mega Cat Studios Collection 2. This one has 8 games with Alter Ego, Arcagus Revolution, Dev Will 2, Gluff, 
misplaced, Ro Meow and Julie Cat, Roni Yu's Tail, and Yazzie. Ah, how did they come up with these names? This is similar to the Indie Heroes cartridge in that all the games are indie. All of these are Genesis games except for Roni Yu's Tail, which is NES. And all of them are puzzle games except for Arcagus Revolution. So all in all, it doesn't really have much for me since I'm not a big fan of puzzle games. But Arcagus Revolution is a really fun shooter that's reminiscent of the arcade game called Assault. Here's the Intellivision Collection 1 with 12 games. You get Astro Smash, Buzz Bombers, Frog Bog, Night Stalker, Pinball, Princess Quest, Shark Shark, Slapshot Pro Hockey, Snafu, Thin Ice, Thundercastle, and Word Rockets. I don't have any nostalgia for the Intellivision, and this might be the first time I've ever played it, even emulated. A lot of these games need a keypad, which you can call up by holding one of the shoulder buttons. If you like the Intellivision, you might get a kick out of it, but I just can't get into it. Princess Quest is a newer game from 2014 like Ghouls and Ghosts though, which is almost cool. Finally, we have the Bitmap Brothers Collection 1. This gives you five games with Speedball, Speedball 2100, Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe, The Chaos Engine, and Xenon 2 Mega Blast. Once again, I think it might help if you're a bit British or at least European with this one. I've never been able to get into Speedball or really any futuristic sports game. What's interesting to me though is that Speedball is the Master System version. Speedball 2 is the Genesis version. Speedball 2100 is the PlayStation version. The Chaos Engine is the Super NES version, and it's the best game on here unless you really dig speedball. Xenon 2 is the Mega Drive version, I think. It's pretty awful and probably the worst game on here unless you really, really hate speedball. And there's the Evercade VS as they call it, but they're perfectly fine if you call it the Versus instead. I am very disappointed in the lack of control options in this latest batch of cartridges, but I am hoping that they can fix that with a firmware update. I don't know if they can or not, but I am hoping they can. Anyway, I think this goes a long way to making it more viable for home use. So what do you think? Are you going to get an Evercade VS Versus? Why or why not? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. You know, I forgot to take this apart at the beginning of the episode, so let's see what makes it tick. Green Dog on the Sega Genesis? I don't know what's real anymore. Hello and welcome to GameSack. It's finally time to dedicate an episode to Sega's very first home gaming console, the SG-1000. Now this wasn't released in North America or many other places for that matter. Anyway, let's start things off with a quick overview of the system itself. The SG-1000 was Sega's first dedicated gaming platform for the home market. It was released at the same time as the SC-3000 computer is based on, the 15th of July, 1983. Yes, this is also the very same day Nintendo released the Famicom. Its main market was in Japan, but it was also released in limited quantities in a few other regions. The console itself has a hardwired controller that looks like a miniature Atari 7800 joystick and also a port for a second controller. I can't imagine anyone enjoying using these controllers very much. 
You could even expand the SG-1000's capabilities with a keyboard. Most games came on the cartridge format, however Sega console designer Hideki Sato disliked them, saying they looked like little black tombstones. So he came up with the card catcher, which would play Sega My Cards, which held less overall memory. But the size of games back then was already pretty small. The SG-1000 is powered by a Z80A CPU running at a blazing 3.58 MHz. It has a resolution of 256 by 192 pixels with a mind-blowing 16 colors. Up to 32 sprites could be on screen at once. There's no hardware support for background scrolling, it all has to be done in software. The sound consists of three exciting square wave channels and one noise channel. The redesigned SG-1000 Mark II was released the following year and featured two detachable joy pads. Overall, it had about 74 officially released games and sold about 1.5 million units. Also, the SG-1000's AV output was limited to RF. I mean, that's just how things were back then. Now, there weren't a whole lot of video games released for the system, so I figured I'd cover them all in a single episode, even some of the unlicensed ones. Now, these games are pretty simple, so it's not like there's a ton to discuss anyway, but I came up with 90 of them to cover, so <laughs> let's get right into it. We start off with 007 James Bond from Parker Brothers. This one was made for the Othello Multivision clone, but can run on the SG-1000. You start out with James Bond in his submersible car, and he can shoot up and down. You also have limited control over your car, and you can rise in the air or sink below for a very short burst. It's quite difficult. Nothing about this really grabbed me. Next is Bank Panic from Sega. Here, you scroll left and right and line yourself up with three doors which all open automatically. You have to shoot the evil criminals, but be careful because you don't want to shoot all of the people who want to give you money for some reason. And a lot of them want to give you money. Button 2 shoots the right gun, button 1 shoots the middle gun, and pressing up or down shoots the left gun. You need to get money from every door to complete the round. It's kind of interesting. This is The Black Onyx, one of the very first RPGs made for the Japanese market. It's a dungeon crawler, and these days it's a bit convoluted to figure out. Still, I like it a bit better than the sequel which we reviewed in the MSX episode, mainly because this one has music, though I imagine it might get a little tiring after a while. The battle system is easy enough to figure out. If you like fighting dudes with no pants, then be sure to play this game as soon as you can. This was one of the very last games to be released for the SG-1000, coming out in 1987. In fact, it was the final game in card format. Here's Bomb Jack. You play as a gentleman who needs to collect all of the bomb icons in any given level whilst avoiding the fiendish enemies. One hit and you die. Fortunately, you can jump pretty high. You can also collect a power-up which kind of works like the Big Dot and Pac-Man, incapacitating the enemies for a brief time. This is good because the screen quickly fills with enemies. I like this one a lot, the only issue is that the graphics can make it tough to see what things are. Bomberman Special was originally an MSX game. It was brought to the SG-1000 as an unlicensed title, but only in Taiwan. To bring the SG-1000 closer to the MSX in terms of memory, this one requires the Daji RAM Extension Adapter to expand the RAM by a whopping 8K. As you can see, this is a pretty bad version of Bomberman with ugly visuals and even worse music. The gameplay isn't even done very well. Not recommended. This one is called Borderline. It starts out as kind of a vertical shooter with you in a jeep moving upwards. You can shoot sideways as long as you're moving sideways. Then you get to some areas that don't scroll. Your main mission in these areas is to shoot all of these weird things. You also need to protect yourself from the enemy, of course. These scenes kind of remind me of Dig Dug. Overall, not a bad little shooter. All right, six games down and a few more than that to go. Now, for some reason, there are a ton of games on the SG-1000 that start with the letter C. Let's do this. Here's CISO from Compile. Your goal in this one is to basically wander around, collect all of the fruit, and kill all of the enemies. Do that and you win the stage. 
There are seesaws, trampolines, and ladders scattered about to help you get around and destroy the bad guys. What can I say? It's not bad, but not great either. Here's Cabbage Patch Kids, originally from Konami. This is another MSX game that was brought to the SG-1000 without a license only in Taiwan. It's basically a simple platformer. At the beginning, you can customize your character. Then you move through screen after screen of minor obstacles. Although you're a Cabbage Patch Kid, touching a cabbage will still kill you dead. It's not an awful game, all things considered. This one's called The Castle. You're a little dude who needs to collect keys to open the same colored doors to advance inside of this diabolical castle. You can also collect other items to help out as well. It's a slight brain teaser to be sure. One button jumps and the other button toggles a slow mode if the game is just too crazy fast for you. This cartridge has an additional 8K of RAM built in. I kind of like this one. I want to keep trying to figure out how to get out of whatever room I'm currently in. Chack and Pop is originally a game from Taito. You're a Chacken, and you need to make your way to the hearts that are in the cages, bomb them, and then escape the level. This is much easier said than done, as the enemies are extremely tough to avoid. Even your own shots are tough to avoid, and tougher to kill enemies with it. I don't like it. This is Challenge Derby. First, you place your bets on some horses in this Othello multivision game. Then they race and you have no control over them because this is a video game. Why would you want to participate in the actual race? Then you see if you won. No thanks. Champion Baseball. This is a primitive baseball game just like you'd expect. I do appreciate the batter pitcher window on the left side of the screen. Hitting is really tough and fielding is extremely easy. Not much else to say here. Champion Billiards. I like this one. It's basically a primitive game of single player pool. All you need to do is get all of the balls in the holes. You aim with the cursor and wait until the automatic power gauge at the top of the screen is where you like it. The physics are decent for the console. I also like that there are different tables to play on that you'd never see in real life. Champion Boxing. That's right, you figured it out. The champion line of games is Sega's sports games for the console, just like the great ones were on the Master System. This is, however, the very first game that Yu Suzuki worked on. The graphics are pretty detailed for the console, but for some reason it's just not as fun as Virtua Fighter 2 or Shenmue or even Enduro Racer. Champion Golf. I can't make heads or tails out of this one. You have a little dude that moves around the border, and that seems to be how you aim. You don't seem to have any control over how hard you hit the ball. There aren't any champions who play this game. Champion Ice Hockey. This is a slow game that I don't feel I have very much, if any, control over. It feels like each player weighs about 350 pounds, and you aim your shot by adjusting an arrow by the goal, which is difficult to do as you're moving. I'd rather play this than Champion Golf, though. Champion Kendo. I can't quite figure out how to play it, much less win at it, but basically you and the other chap are fighting with wooden sticks. At least the music in this one is kind of catchy, I guess. Champion Pro Wrestling. This one has you selecting your moves from a list below you and then executing them. It's not good at all. In fact, I won my first two rounds easily until I found out that I thought I was controlling the wrong guy. Oops. Still, somehow it's not the worst wrestling game I've ever played. Champion Soccer. This is marginally better than Champion Ice Hockey, but that's not saying a lot. Everything moves in a choppy fashion, and as always, the CPU will absolutely wipe the floor with you, even on the amateur level. Like most of these sports games, it's better played with two people who both suck. Champion Tennis. Fortunately, this is the last champion game on the console. The graphics in this one are absolutely garish. There's very little animation, and for some reason, the server is always at the bottom of the screen. 
Still, I'd rather play this one than most 8 and 16-bit tennis games because I can actually hit the damn ball sometimes. Imagine being a tennis game and getting wrecked by an SG-1000 game that looks like this. Here's Championship Load Runner, not Champion Load Runner. I've never really understood Load Runner, and as you can imagine, I don't care much for it. This version is no exception. I don't like playing it. But if you do, well, this is the version that only champions are allowed by law to play. Here's Choplifter, one of my favorite games on the Master System. This version, however, is absolute trash. It has limited memory due to it being on a card, but that's not why it fails. Your goal is to fly behind enemy lines with your helicopter and pick up hostages. Then you return them to your base. Collect a certain amount of hostages to clear the stage. Everything here is extremely choppy and the enemies here are relentless. This may have been fun back in the day, but the enemy AI just doesn't hold up anymore. At least there's some parallax scrolling. I've never been able to get past the first area on this one and I've been trying for years. I hate this game. Hate, hate, hate it. I absolutely love it though, because it's Choplifter, a definite must own. Circus Charlie is an unlicensed port of a Konami arcade game. It was only released in South Korea and Taiwan. Basically, your mission is to make your way to the right and not touch anything at all, or you die. Your control over Charlie isn't very fluid, so it can be tough until you learn the patterns. I'm impressed with the smooth scrolling, which is something that usually doesn't happen on this console, so that's cool. Congo Bongo is a port of Sega's arcade game which tried to cash in on Donkey Kong. The arcade featured an isometric 3D-ish viewpoint, however this one is straight up 2D, which is fine. Your goal in this one is to simply make your way to the gorilla, that's it. And it's easier said than done as the control is slippery at best. The second part of each round has an overhead-like area. Be careful here, as if you even think about the water, you die. Beat this and do it all again. Overall, this might have entertained the simple minds back in the early 80s, but it doesn't do much for us big-brained hyper-intelligent fellows of the 2020s. Actually, you know what? It is kind of fun. This is Doki Doki Penguin Land. Your goal is to move your egg to the bottom of the very long screen without breaking it. You can dig holes and drop rocks on enemies, but don't let your egg fall too far. That's the gist of it, and it's a game that I've never really been able to extract much enjoyment from. Other people seem to enjoy this game, though. Here's Dragon Wang. This one is almost interesting. It looks like Kung Fu, but it actually plays like a broken-ass cross between Sega's Kung Fu Kid and Black Belt. Both of those are on the Master System. This game would be pretty good if they had spent more than three or four minutes in designing the actual gameplay. You make your way to an individual, beat him, and he holds a key. And you need all the keys so you can touch the dragon's glorious wang. You jump up to higher levels by pressing down first before pressing up to jump. Sadly, you lose life really fast, and if you die, you lose any keys that you've collected. So you have to do the entire thing on a single life, which is just stupid and ruins it. But the thought of that dragon wang will keep you trying again, and again, and again. This one's called Droll. Basically, you wander back and forth between levels. You can shoot your gun at will, float, and go between levels where you see the little white thing on the floor. I'm not entirely sure what the goal is. I collected this girl and that seemed to be all to do on the level, no exit to go to. Then I got killed by this green alligator. Whoops, no, I guess that transported me to level two. This one's okay, I guess. Elevator Action is a port by Sega of the Taito arcade game. Basically, you're at the top of a hotel and you need to get to the bottom where your car is so you can go to McDonald's. This is not a well-designed building, so there are many different elevators that you need to take. On your way, you'll shoot people who emerge from their room simply because they exist. I mean, you can be pretty grouchy before you've had your McDonald's. Overall, it's not bad at all, though for some reason, it's not quite as good as Elevator Action Returns on the Saturn. This is Exerion. I covered this game in the MSX episode, and it's pretty much the same here. Shoot down oncoming enemies with a slower double shot or a really fast single shot. However, your fast single shots aren't unlimited. 
The number under charge indicates how many of those shots you have. Killing an enemy will grant you one more charge. I like what the graphics are attempting with their pseudo forward scrolling and the way it shifts left and right when you move that way. Pretty neat for such a primitive console. This one's pretty fun to play, too. Alright, here's the worst version of Flicky ever made. You need to collect the birds and take them to the top to save them. But watch out for the evil cats that are running around. Throughout each level are objects that you can use to hit the cats with. This version seems extra bouncy and it's difficult to ascend the platforms to avoid the cats. But you can get used to it after a short while. The scrolling is pretty smooth for an SG-1000 game though. Flipper, or Sega Flipper, is a video pinball game. Button 1 controls the left flipper and button 2 controls the right. The D-pad simply pulls the plunger back. As you can imagine and also clearly see, this isn't very good video pinball. I don't really have anything else to say about this one. Okay, we're making some progress here, I guess. Up next, the most renowned game for the SG-1000. I mean, after Galaga, because that comes first. Alphabetical. Look, it's Galaga, also sometimes known as Sega Galaga. What can I say? It's Galaga, and it was ported over by Sega. It plays an okay game of Galaga, I guess. I think you're going to want to keep this one turned down pretty low, as it gets annoying to your ears, even more so than most other SG-1000 games already do. Otherwise, it's just primitive Galaga. Girl's Garden is one of the most celebrated games on the SG-1000. For one, it was the first game by both Yuji Naka and also Hiroshi Kawaguchi. Yuji Naka, of course, went on to make Sonic the Hedgehog and other stuff. Hiroshi Kawaguchi went on to become one of Sega's most famous musicians, composing the music for arcades such as Space Harrier, Afterburner, Outrun, and many more. Anyway, in this game, you're a girl and you're trying to win the love of a boy by giving him flowers. Aww. You run around and pick up the fully bloomed ones, filling up the flower gauge at the bottom of the screen. Be careful not to pick the dead flowers, though, or your gauge decreases. Also, be careful of the tough-to-avoid bears. You can distract them with pots of honey, but you have very few at your disposal. At the top of the screen, you'll see the boy walking towards that other girl. This is basically your timer. Once your flower gauge is full, visit the boy in the house and give him the flowers. This woos him good, and he walks back to you, and you hear wedding music composed by the same musician who composed Sword of Vermilion on the 16-bit Sega Genesis. Then you divorce really quick and go on to the next stage, which features different flowers. Sometimes you even get a challenging stage. You need to jump over all these crazy blocky animals. Yeah, it's pretty blocky. But hey, so is the Super Nintendo's Mode 7, so you have absolutely no choice but to love how this looks. It even has some parallax scrolling, even though it's pretty choppy. I've got to say that this game is pretty inventive, and I like it a lot. Some people actually waste their emotions being offended by this game for having a girl try to woo a guy instead of rescuing him. Come on, people, lighten up and enjoy life. Here's Golgo 13. This one places you in a car and you need to shoot out all of the windows on the train in the distance. If you do, then the passenger riding the train hops out and goes the rest of the way on foot. I mean, who wants to take the train when you could just walk instead? Be careful of things that can ricochet your bullets right back at you and kill you. Each level adds a bit of stuff to help make the game a bit tougher. Overall, it's not very exciting. Believe it or not, the NES games are better. GP World is a racing game, surprise, surprise. Your goal is to make it around two laps of the track in less than the qualifying amount of time. Not great, but I would have enjoyed this as a small child. This would evolve into World Grand Prix on the Master System, and that's being quite generous with the word evolve. Here's Goal Cave from Compile. This is one of the more graphically ambitious games for the SG-1000. It's a horizontal shooter and it even has parallax scrolling. It also has tons of fast-moving sprites all over the place. Unfortunately, these sprites can be tough to avoid. For that reason, you have a power gauge and can take a few hits before you lose a life. You can power up your weapon by collecting the numbers. If you get one you like, then don't get any more numbers or you might regret it. The enemies aren't interesting at all and their patterns are more annoying than anything. 
Still, like I said, this one's pretty ambitious. It even lets you put in your name on the high score table. Not only that, but it even lets you continue, which was unheard of back then, if any of these other games are to be used as examples. Kudos to Compile for the effort. This is Guzzler. It's for the Othello Multivision. You're a little thing that roams the level and you need to put out all of the fires. To do this, you spit water at them. Your water can also be used to kill enemies. There are puddles around to refill yourself and you can hold three water spits when you're full. After the big fires are put out, you clear the level. It's a fun game, but the sound is perhaps one of the more annoying things that you'll ever hear in your time on this earth. This is H-E-R-O, which is an acronym for something. F the police, I'm just gonna call it HERO. You have a rocket pack, a few sticks of dynamite, and a laser beam. Make your way down to the bottom to rescue the random person who's trapped. Touch anything and you die. It's actually pretty fun once you get the hang of the controls. It looks similar to most of the other versions of this game, though they had a helicopter backpack instead of a rocket pack. That's dumb, rocket packs are way better. Sega wins again. Here's Hang On 2. This plays just like the Master System version of Hang On, only slightly broken in comparison. Your motorcycle doesn't stay centered on screen when you move, so the controls feel slippery. Everything is also much choppier, and the road itself is drawn by someone who doesn't know what perspective is. Still, after a few minutes, I adapted to the controls and was able to do pretty well for myself. Supposedly, this is the sequel to the Master System Hang On, which explains the similarities. The main difference here is that music plays while you race, which is pretty cool. This music was actually in the Master System game, but it's unused for some stupid reason. All of the other music is identical to the Master System game. Home Mahjong. Oh hell yeah, now you can finally play Mahjong at home! It's Mahjong though, so who cares? However, this one came with a piece of plastic you could attach to your TV to prevent the other player from seeing your pieces. That's as interesting as it gets. Hustle Chew Me is a weird game by Compile. You control a mouse who sets out to get all of the food in a level and then make your way back to the doorway where you began the stage. You can jump forward and also shoot something which kills most but not all of the enemies. It's a neat idea that's fun for a few minutes. The music is absolutely atrocious though, which is unusual for a Compile game. Hypersports is a Sega port of a Konami game. It's like track and field, except totally not track and field. Compete in different events where you get three attempts at each. I eventually figured out the diving, but it took several minutes. This next event is even tougher, and if you fail, you have to start over. This is a game that could really use some continues. Hypersports 2 is the sequel and only released in Taiwan. Three new events here. The skeet shooting was crazy when I first started. I understand how it works, but it really felt chaotic. By the third attempt on my first game, I had it mastered though. The archery segment is a bit tougher. Sadly, there still aren't any continues, but this one seems more doable. I like this one better than part one. King's Valley is another Taiwan exclusive game and it requires the Daji Ram expansion. Basically, you run around collecting treasures. Once you get them all, you can unlock the door to go to the next level. You can grab a sword to toss at enemies, or a pick to dig through some areas. If you die, everything gets reset, so making progress is tough. I like the idea, but perhaps that extra 8K of memory could have gone towards remembering the treasures I've already collected and the holes I've already dug. I gotta remember how primitive everything was back then, though. Nightmare is originally from Konami, and the unlicensed SG-1000 version only saw release in Taiwan. This also requires the Daji Ram adapter. It's a vertical shooter where you play as a knight. You can uncover various chess pieces by shooting the question mark boxes, and these can do various things for you like destroy all on-screen enemies. The power-ups are interesting as well. You can amplify your shot, become invisible for a short time, and even invincible. You can even stop time to destroy everything on screen. Fortunately, there are boss encounters that help keep things interesting. Ultimately, the game feels very slow thanks to the scrolling. Here's yet another unlicensed Taiwan exclusive for the SG-1000, The Legend of Kage. 
This version is extremely choppy, which means it's also insanely laggy. I couldn't get the first stage to end. The enemies just kept appearing. They're also pretty cheap as I got killed right after my super attack ended, and there was absolutely no way to avoid it. The dodgy RAM extension doesn't help make this game very playable. Here's Load Runner. Not Championship Load Runner, just Load Runner. This is the one that the losers play. I must be a loser myself because I like this version more than the Championship Edition. Not that I actually like it, mind you. Maybe if I were 70 years old, I might appreciate it a bit more. Loretta no Shouzu, or Portrait of Loretta, is a point-and-click Sherlock Holmes game. It was also the final game release for the SG-1000, coming out in 1987. It's also the largest game for the console, clocking in at a whopping... <laughs> or 128 kilobytes. It was packaged as a Mark III game, but it doesn't use any of that console's more advanced features as you can clearly see here. This game is pretty much unplayable unless you know some Japanese. Here's Magical Kid Wiz. This is another Taiwanese game that needs the Daji RAM expansion. It's a platformer where you shoot and collect icons. In fact, the overall gameplay is kind of confusing. I feel bad for the person who is in charge of hiring the guy who did the music. They probably feel like their money was completely wasted. And it was. The music makes it nearly impossible to concentrate on playing this choppy ass game. Magical Tree was ported without a license to the SG-1000 in Taiwan. This was originally a Konami arcade game. Basically, you need to climb this tree and get as high as you can while collecting things for points. Be careful of the enemies though, because all they want to do is make you fall. This one's pretty simple and it's even kind of fun. I recommend trying it out at least once. Here's Mahjong. Just Mahjong, not home Mahjong or anything like that. All this is is super basic Mahjong. The end. Monaco GP is Sega's port of their own arcade game. Race as far up as you can trying to get the high score. If you press a button, you kind of flip around, which allows you to go through obstacles like other cars. The scrolling is decently smooth in this one. It's actually fun for a few minutes, but it's not quite as good as Super Monaco GP in the arcades or even on the Genesis. There's really no excuse for that. Here's N-Sub by Sega. The gameplay can best be described as a cross between IREM's In the Hunt and Sega's own Poseidon Wars 3D for the Master System. This one is based on a 1980 arcade game though. Sega has multiple submarine based games, I mean they love submarines. This one lets you fire horizontally and vertically and well you can basically see exactly what the game is. Slow, but kind of fun. Yeah, the sound is a touch annoying. Here's a port of Ninja Princess from Sega. This version actually plays pretty well, all things considered. One button shoots straight ahead no matter which way you face, and the other button shoots in the direction that you're running. Press them both together to disappear for a second to avoid enemy projectiles. The main problem is the shoddy colors can make some of these projectiles rather difficult to see. The screen scrolls in steps rather than continuously. Still, not a bad game at all for the SG-1000. Of course, the Ninja on the Master System absolutely destroys it. This is Okamoto Ayako no Match Play Golf for the Othello Multivision. This one is interesting due to its pseudo 3D view. Make no mistake though, no polygons are used here. Neither is any well-designed gameplay. I suppose it might be a bit easier if I could read Japanese, but no matter what, your shots are terribly difficult to control. I really can't recommend this to anyone. Still, it's way better than Champion Golf. Here's Orgus. This is a horizontal shooter where you fly as a big mech. You can hold the button down for automatic fire. The other button transforms you into a jet or a spaceship or something like that. The screen scrolls faster and you have to press the button each time you fire. However, you're also a smaller target for the enemies to hit. I like how there's some attempt made at parallax scrolling and honestly the choppiness isn't too offensive. Well until you get here that is. Yikes. Not bad, but not very exciting either.
Othello is a tile flipping game. Could this be for the Othello multivision? Hmm, I wonder. It's easy to figure out the rules just by playing it once, though you'll probably lose in the process. You place a tile down and flip over the opposite ones between your new tile and the one that's already on the board. Your goal is to have more tiles on the board than your opponent once it fills up. Not awful, I guess, and that's really all I have to say about Othello. By the way, Othello was built into the Othello Multivision, or Multivision if you want to say it that way. Neither is incorrect, and neither is incorrect as well. But it was also released on cartridge for SG-1000 owners. Anyway, that's 57 games down and the rest to go. Let's finish this up. Here's Pac-Har by Sega. This is a Pac-Man clone, plain and simple. Get it? Pac-Har, half Pac-Man, half car? Okay, moving on. As you collect the dots, the enemies will sometimes drop big dots, which you can then collect and eat the enemies for a bit. If you try to go backwards on the road, you'll go into a reverse and therefore move more slowly. Also, some of the tracks are bridges over others. There only seems to be two different screens, but it does get more difficult with more enemy cars. Give it a go if you like Pac-Man as well as extreme racing action. This is Pachinko. Launch balls to win points or other balls, I guess. I lost interest after about three seconds, but supposedly they go absolutely crazy over this in Japan. Ah yes, Pachinko 2. Because there needs to be more of this crap. This time you have three boards. If your needs are extremely simple, pick this one up. Pipples is another game only released in Taiwan. And yes, it needs the RAM expansion as well. You're a dude who can shoot up and down and hop to the left and right. Murder the enemies while collecting items for points. It's a long ways to the top. Once you get there, you can choose your path, which is pretty cool. It can sometimes be tough to avoid the enemies, but all in all, I've got to say that this is kind of fun. The scrolling is smooth as well. Thank goodness for that massive amount of memory. Here's Pitfall 2, The Lost Caverns. This is more like the original Pitfall and not like the other Pitfall 2 called The Mayan Adventure, which showed up on the 16-bit platforms. It's kind of crazy that there are two Pitfall 2s. Anyway, touch anything, even water, and you die immediately. The collision detection is dialed up to 11. I've never really been a big fan of the first Pitfall, and this one doesn't win me over either. This one is called Pop Flamer. The idea is to pop all of the balloons by walking over them. You can also breathe fire. The control in this one sucks, and it's difficult to avoid the enemies in time. Also, the sound is annoying. If you like games that could have used 30 more seconds in the design process, give this one a go. Here's Cubert. This was made for the Othello Multivision. This one plays surprisingly well. No control shenanigans here like the NES version. Just press the direction you want to go. That's how it should be, and it moves pretty briskly. The audio and visual presentation leaves a lot to be desired, of course, but I don't think you could expect much more from this port. Rally X is another unlicensed Taiwanese port. Race your car around to collect all of the flags in a level. Be sure to avoid the enemy cars who want nothing more than to crash right into you. You also have to contend with a few boulders in the road here and there. The extra RAM attachment helps this one scroll smoothly both horizontally and vertically, which is amazing for the console. As a game, it's decent. Road Fighter is yet another Taiwanese port that needs the extra RAM. It looks like Spy Hunter, but it certainly doesn't play like it. You drive the world's most fragile and least fuel-efficient car from point A to point B. You start with a full tank, but it'll be empty in less than a minute. Collecting the hard icons helps restore some fuel. If you crash into the other cars or the side of the road, you'll still lose fuel even though you're not moving. You might want to patch up the hole in your tank. Honestly though, it's kind of fun, but you really need to turn the sound off for this one. Here's Rock and Bolt, which was originally from Activision. There are several sliding platforms that you need to bolt in place. The platforms then stop moving. If you trap yourself, you can undo some bolts and get them moving again. Bolt them all to go to the next level, which looks exactly the same. I found this one pretty boring personally, though I do give them kudos for the concept.
This is Safari Hunting from Sega. This one is also known as Tranquilizer Gun in the arcade. Get out of your trunk and tranquilize any of the animals that you see. They'll remain tranked for about 30 seconds. Use this time to drive your truck counterclockwise around the screen to pick them up. If they're not on the outside of the screen where your truck is, you'll need to move them there. This is an okay game, but I like the revamped version on the PS2 Sega Ages collection a lot more. Here's Safari Race. Ooh, this is gonna be like Sega Rally, I bet. Yeah, no. You race along the track avoiding all of the wildlife that are making a beeline towards the road and you. Animals love doing this because they're stupid and not smart like people. If you get hit, you lose a tire and you have four spare tires. You also have to watch your fuel. Fortunately, there's a gas station to refuel every few hundred meters just like in the real safari. The hardest part is stopping to refuel. This might have been a fun game, but worrying about your fuel makes it more annoying than anything. At least the scrolling of the mountains on the horizon is really smooth when it gets up to speed. This is San Nin Mahjong, also known as Three Nin Mahjong, because three is San in Japanese. Anyway, it looks and sounds a hair better than Home Mahjong. Other than that, it's just another Mahjong game, who cares? This is Sirizawa Hachidan no Tsumi Shiugi. That's a mouthful. This appears to be a Japanese tile-based game that I have no clue whatsoever how to play. Pretty exciting stuff. This one's called Shinyashin Toru-kun, sometimes known as Mikey. It's originally an arcade game from Konami. Your goal in this scene is to bump the students out of their chairs to collect the white hearts while the teacher chases you. While this is happening, A Hard Day's Night is playing for some reason. The teacher is really on your ass and you barely have time to do anything. Sometimes you can actually sit and the teacher will calm the hell down, but the controls to do this seem random. In fact, the controls in this game are awful. If you get caught, you have to start over and nothing you collected remains collected. F you, Konami. I'd pass on this game. It's too bad because it has potential. Sinbad Mystery is a weird take on Pac-Man. Roam the maze and collect all of the question marks. Also, avoid the wizards and whatnot. You can dig holes, but this doesn't seem to accomplish much. Maybe you can roll these boulders in there, but I don't know, I'm not really concerned about it. Anyway, after you collect all of the question marks, a treasure appears somewhere for you to grab. Do so, and you win the level. For some reason, there's a map on the right side of the screen which is completely useless. I mean, I can see everything already. Not sure why that exists. The way your character wiggles makes it feel like he's hard to control. I often found myself pressing a direction and him just not going that way. Eh, I'd rather play Pac-Man. Here's Saukoban. This is a puzzle game just like Boxel on the Game Boy or Shove It on the Genesis. Push the boxes onto the dots. I've never liked any incarnation of this game, so no thank you. Space Armor is a very primitive vertical shooter. This Othello multivision title has you have a main shot for airborne targets as well as a reticle to fire on ground targets. Not much going on here. Every time you fire your weapon, the music cuts out, but that's honestly a blessing in this case. Space Invaders. What can I say? It's Space Invaders. It fits well on the console, I guess. Now you can finally play this brilliant masterpiece at home. Here's Space Mountain for the Othello Multivision. Just like the Space Mountain roller coaster at Disneyland, you pilot an X-Wing fighter and shoot down TIE fighters with slow and inaccurate controls. Then you fly into the Death Star Trench where the controls no longer work and you can't avoid things coming at you. Man, it feels like I'm six years old again, which was the last time I visited a Walt Disney location. And I'm fine with that because I can just relive the memory from the comfort of my own home with this turd. This is Space Slalom. Pilot the space shuttle through gates while avoiding obstacles in this tiny 8 kilobit game. Be careful not to hit the rings. Gah, that can't be good for the shuttle. Guess I'll probably burn up on re-entry. It takes a few seconds to truly be able to master the controls, but if you can stick with the game that long, you're good. Once you do, even the hardest difficulties are super easy. That's it, that's Space Slalom. Here's Star Force. 
This is a vertical shooter that reminds me a bit of Astro Warrior on the Master System. The jerky backgrounds here are really distracting. You can collect little power-ups that don't seem to do much of anything. You can also collect huge power-ups. Look at this. Oops, I guess that wasn't a power-up. It's a little bit too choppy for my taste, honestly. This one's called Starjacker. You start out with four ships and all of them can shoot. If one of them gets hit, you lose it for the rest of the round. As a result, your firepower slightly decreases. If you lose all of your ships, it's game over. If you can beat the round, you can get a ship back. I like how when you beat a round, your ship gets huge and blocky, just like the Super Nintendo does when it enlarges things. Absolutely amazing. Not a bad little game. Oh look, here's Star Soldier. This is an unlicensed Taiwanese port that requires the RAM expansion. I've gotta say though that honestly, this isn't half bad. It's a lot better than I thought it would be. Yes, it's choppy, but it isn't as distracting as Star Force. Even the music is pretty good considering the hardware. I wish there were more variety in the stages though. Super Tank. More like Super Awkward Tank. Move your tank around and kill the enemies while attempting to remain in the realm of the living. That's a tall order though, as your tank is not only slow and clunky, but difficult to hit enemies when you fire. If you press both buttons simultaneously, you can launch a big missile for massive damage. It doesn't seem to work on the bosses though. This one could be better, even for its time. This is Tank Battalion, a Taiwanese game that requires the memory expansion. This one plays a lot like combat on the Atari 2600. Shoot all of the tanks while defending your flashing symbol at the bottom center of the screen. Both you and the enemy can break down walls with a few shots. This one is simple and entertaining. It's also light years more fun than Super Tank. Here's Twin B. This is an unlicensed conversion of the MSX game only released in Taiwan. And yes, it needs the Daji RAM expansion, though you'd never be able to tell by playing it. This is a rather poor representation of the arcade game with inconsistent collision detection. The music kind of tries though, otherwise it's just a ghetto version of Twin B. Wonder Boy made it to the SG-1000 the same year as the arcade release. This isn't a good conversion at all. It's extremely choppy, there's zero momentum which makes the control feel weird, the jump and attack buttons are reversed, and it's incredibly slow. The sound effects are the same as the Master System version, but the music here is all new stuff, none of it being any good. Wonder Boy has green hair here though, which he'd have again in Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap for some reason. This one's called Yamato. You're blasting other ships, submarines, and even planes flying around. At first I thought you were simply a speedboat that had a big issue with other boats and things that were in the water. That would have been pretty awesome. But if you look closely, you can tell it's the front of a battleship that's on the bottom of the screen. That makes it a little bit more run of the mill. This one's not particularly exciting though, maybe it helps someone learn to code. Here's an unlicensed port of Yai R Kung Fu 2 for Taiwan. Yes, it needs the extra memory. Your goal in this one is to defeat the children that are flying at you and work your way to the left. Then you fight the boss. Maybe he was throwing the children at you? Beating him is easier said than done as the controls are pretty awful. You start out with 10 lives and I lost interest in playing this one before I even ran out of lives. Ah yes, good old Zaxxon. Fly your ship through the enemy base in this isometric shooter ported from Sega's own arcade game. You also have to worry about your height to clear obstacles. You use up fuel quickly and can blast fuel drums to replenish it. At least this version has music, unlike the ColecoVision version. Still, Zaxxon 3D on the Master System will always be the best Zaxxon game. And that is not a huge compliment. Zippy Race, originally from IREM. This starts out as an overhead view racing game where you're on a motorcycle racing against cars who are all trying to hit you. You also need to avoid puddles and other hazards. Not only that, but you don't have a lot of fuel so you'll have to pick up some gas. Eventually, it'll switch to a 3D type view to spice things up. Still, this one just isn't very interesting and the annoying music doesn't help. Finally, Zoom 909 is a port of one of Sega's earlier arcade games. It's known in some regions as Buck Rogers, Planet of Zoom. 
It's also one of the more ambitious games on the SG-1000 here. You start out by flying in a Death Star-like trench. Then, you're in a wider area shooting down enemies. Then, you move to an overhead free-roaming view with lots of stuff on screen at once. After that, you fight the boss. Then you do it all again. You also need to worry about fuel, which seems to be a big thing in games from this era. You can die as much as you want, but when your fuel runs out, it's game over. Everything here moves incredibly smooth for the system, not a hint of choppiness anywhere, really. Except for maybe the boss. Even the free-roaming overhead view scrolls smoothly in all eight directions. Seriously, this is mind-blowing for this console. They even devote some CPU to play music during the game. It really is the total package. It's pretty fun as well, and I recommend playing this one for sure. And there you go, that's the SG-1000 for you. I don't think the majority of the world was really missing out on much. Most of these games are really only fun for a few minutes, but you know, I guess that was the mindset back then. And before you start typing your comment about how lame all these games are, yes, I know, everybody knows. Still, it's interesting to see how Sega begun their journey into people's homes. This episode is for people who can appreciate history. So I've got to be frank and say that I'm glad that my first experience with Sega wasn't with the SG-1000. <laughs> anyway, what do you think of the SG-1000? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Well, I got that all in one take. Future